Hey, what's going on? This is David Palmer, the Leo King, and Dr. Ann for History in the Stars. We are going to be going into Sir Isaac Newton tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. I mean, it's been a very extreme time in the world. We are sitting here on October the 7th of 2022, and... Um, I'm so glad that you're such an amazing historian that goes into so many different time periods. It's not like it's new when the world goes through major changes. And I just feel like this is an important time for us to really look at somebody like Sir Isaac Newton, who really was at a big turning point in the world. Mm -hmm. After so many things that really felt uncertain, he brought a lot of certainty to the world. He did bring a lot of certainty. He brought... He brought certainty, I think, for the modern era. A lot of what he accomplished was making people feel that they understood the natural laws behind the universe. And he did that coming out of a turbulent, crazy time. His life was in the midst of some of the craziest things that happened in England. So I don't know. It's kind of a lesson for us today, I think. Yeah, and I feel like it's a really... Um interesting time period because it is a time period it you know it's where you start to see the world finally starting to come out of a lot of divisiveness he's kind of this moment where things start to settle in a little bit more than what was seen throughout the 1500s i mean i think the 1500s were where we see the biggest split in the world and then it's like trying to find where things settle down mm -hmm. and it's you know coming into the 1700s in his life where it feels like things kind of settle there yeah by the end of his life i think things had settled for a while but if you look at um i compiled a list of of things that happened during his life if if we want to look at yeah that. i would love if to look at that look at the, major events that happened in his life. You are the history professor. And yes. so I, I actually know more about his alchemical and his um, discoveries from uh, things in cosmology and, and so mm -hmm. forth. But that's pretty much as far as I went with him. Well, I wanted to just point out, this is his life. So he's born in 1642. The year that he was born, the English Civil War began. And the king was captured and imprisoned. Um, the king was convicted of treason and beheaded in 1649. A commonwealth was established. Um, Oliver Cromwell didn't, didn't do so well when he, I mean, after he died, there was nobody to take over because his son couldn't hold power. Then they bring back another king. They bring back King Charles II. Um, you know, the, it was a really crazy time. Also, there's something that people don't know about Newton, that he, they were passing laws during Newton's life, actually, that outlawed Newton's beliefs. So he was... That was a pretty common thing, though, in those times. Uh, am I correct? That, like that other, other um, people that were philosophers or maybe alchemists or um, going against maybe the Catholic Church or maybe against the crown at that time, mm -hmm. depending on what time period you want to use. But within that hundred years, there was a lot of this is the right way or this is the wrong way, would you say? Mm -hmm. Very much. So, and Newton believed everything he wasn't supposed to believe and had to hide it in order to carry on with his career. So this was the time with the Church of England, and one of the beliefs of the Church of England was a belief in the Trinity. And Newton didn't believe in the Trinity because he didn't believe you could have three equal parts that could constitute one God, that there had to be an original God that then created the Son of God, that it couldn't be the same substance. And so for people that don't know, what would the Trinity, three parts of the Trinity be? Oh, the Father, which is God, the Son, Jesus, and the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Ghost. Yeah. 
Holy Spirit. Or they said, was it Holy Ghost back then? I think that they said Holy Ghost, yeah. In Maybe the they book. changed it because of people so afraid of ghosts in this life that we live in today's society. I don't know. Maybe. But I've always, yeah, I've always heard the Holy Ghost more in the ancient mm -hmm. talk. And then yeah. you hear the Holy Spirit at churches today, which I is kind of interesting. Why. Yeah, that'd be an interesting, we could maybe do a whole thing on that. <laughs> but I also have another yeah. question. Because he was born during the English Civil War, and it's interesting whenever I talk to people about it, a lot of, especially Americans, really don't even know much about it. Mm -hmm. But if you were the mother of Sir Isaac Newton, having a child in the middle of the English Civil War, what would that have been different for a mother prior to it? Hmm, that's a good question because what would have affected Newton's life more is the fact that his father died, uh, I think, three months before he was born. Mm. So that would have been a much bigger issue for where she lived. She lived in, in the northern part of England and not much around the Civil War would have affected her at that point. As a person with a new baby, she would have been more concerned with uh, her livelihood and probably trying to find another husband. Right. You know, which she did pretty quickly. But with not having a monarch for pretty much, would that have been the first time for a person in the Commonwealth of, mm -hmm. of, the, of, of how, how, many, how many years or how many centuries? Would, wouldn't that have been a major turn for being in a person in England where the people now are taking control of mm -hmm. their rule as a country and yeah. the monarch being gone? Like if yeah, today, if we were to just see Buckingham Palace and now King Charles III just disappear, mm -hmm. I wonder how that would have felt like back then. Well, it would, where we could think about it even more would be, okay, let's say um, during the insurrection mm -hmm. that something actually happened and then Trump was captured and executed publicly because the king was taken out in front of one of his best palaces and executed publicly in front of the ordinary people. So his imagine, head was chopped off, yeah, correct? Yep. I had that's what this picture was. I wonder Oh wonderful. There, there's a picture of um, very vivid detail, even with a child standing up there to take a good look at the king's head. Oh, that's funny. I remember. Off. I forgot what show we did when we talked about this, and I laughed <laughs> I the know. most about how there was children. Oh around, yeah, children, and, and then um, a fainting woman here, but just all these people watching. And um, I mean, it would have really been the most shocking thing people would have been able to see, right? Because yeah. you believe the king, even though it wasn't like divine right of kings. You believe really like. They'd kind of move beyond it, thinking, oh, God appointed this person and we must all obey him. There's still the sense that he is the monarch because it's divinely ordained. And if you chop off the king's head, what's going to happen to the rest of the comp, the whole, all the subjects who are supposed to be right. ordered underneath the king? So. I was also thinking because he, the monarch is in charge and is the high I guess you would say Pope, but it's not Pope, right? But is is the head of the Church of England. So that's yeah. why I was thinking as a mother having a child, maybe if his beliefs were so different than the, the standard way of how to believe, maybe there was something to the way that his mother raised him in those early years of, well, I guess the Church of England now is not from a monarch. And also just the understanding of how life is going to be. And it's not like it stays that way for a long time, right? Like it's almost like his life is born into a civil war where the people win and then the monarch eventually does come back. And mm -hmm. so he lives through two different ways of life, literally. Yeah. Um, and he was more of a Puritan in the way that he believed. So he was 
already somebody who didn't fit into the Church of England, which, so the king is the head of the Church of England, and um, a really royalist person would have probably been, a royalist family would have been more affected by that. Mm. But what's just really interesting is um, historians who've studied common people during the English Civil War and during during the Reformation when they were going back and forth with what were religious beliefs, we see that common people kind of just continued on in the way that they already practiced their religion. And the trick was, if you were going to go into um, public life, you had to at least attend church, you had to be, uh, you had to go to confession, I mean not confession, you had to go to um, communion within the Church of England, and you would have had to profess those beliefs. So that was a problem for Isaac Newton later, but for his mom, she actually married a clergyman um, when Newton was two, I believe. Mm. So you know, she, they would have been dealing with the church and probably not feeling the effects so much of the English, the Civil War that was happening. Right. And when Oliver Cromwell took over, he was more of a Puritan. So they might have so, even thought those beliefs were better. Right, so he wouldn't have been, you know, telling the people to go to church the same way that the monarch was mm -hmm. touting how to do. It reminds right. me of politics today. If you're on the left, you don't hear them talk about God or church. And if you're on the right, it's like, your passage is that you must talk about Jesus or right. you're kind of not trusted on the right. So it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. It's like if you talk about God on the left or even Jesus, you're kind of crazy. And if you're <laughs> right. not talking about God on the right, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, he's, a, he's a maverick in many ways. Yeah. Well, he was a maverick in so many ways. Right. And I just thought that was interesting at, at the start of his life because it's in astrology, I think a lot of people think it's the rising and the, the placement of the planets when they were born. And of course, if they're on a full moon, which he was born as a full moon was starting to apex, but it's a lot also about the environment in which you're born under mm -hmm. in old ways too. It's the weather to events that are happening, right? That mm -hmm. that all is considered when looking at an astrology chart. And so I think that it's interesting that he's a, his portal into this world was in the middle of the first time in England where there seemed to be, no matter how much monarch craziness there always was within the monarch or with the people, it was the peak of both, right? The people against the monarch and mm -hmm. also within the monarch, not knowing how to know what to do. Yeah. You know, what's interesting as you were just talking about that right now, um, I was thinking of an alchemical idea. Mm. So I don't know if this is di divulging one of the secrets we're going to talk about, but Newton was a hidden alchemist. That's one of the things he had to keep secret. And one of the alchemical principles that he and others were looking for, and I'm sure you could say more about this because you know about the work of John Dee and others, um, but he talked about finding, going from chaos to purity and order, right? That that's the whole uh, life journey, or that's what alchemists were looking for, right? Was to go from cha chaos to something that's divine. And his life was literally like that, right? Going, he, his lifespan was from chaos to a more ordered time for England. Yeah, it's the pendulum that swings between and no matter where we're at, because even the divinity is chaos just as much as it is divine order. It's, it's what's in between that, which is art and nature, which mm. is human nature and understanding it and the divine nature mm -hmm. and art that we create, but also the divine art that we focus on that keeps us in the balance between the pendulum that swings between chaos mm. and order. So it's, 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 it's understanding all four quadrants, but understanding that the, 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 the two that are fundamental in your life to stay 
in harmony through the chaos and the order is the divine nature and the divine art and the beauty that the divine has created. Hmm. Because if you m sustain in those areas, no matter mm -hmm. when it's in divine chaos or divine order, because chaos has to happen in order for things to get back into order, because sometimes order is what restricts us or keeps us in a place from not evolving at the same time. So hmm. the world constantly does that in our lives. We have moments where it's divine chaos and divine order and we get over chaos and we want order and then we get over order and we want chaos. We're always chasing after something that uh, we want or we're trying to run away from something that we are trying to, we don't want anymore. And so it's like, if you're in your art and the, un the understanding of that art goes into many different places, it's more than painting or mm -hmm. music, but it is the beautifulness and the understanding of the divine art that this world is. And then of course, the understanding of your human nature and how to understand the chaos and order within there and grasp with that and how to be an alchemist is somebody who understands those moments and how to still keep bringing it all to a place of, you know, sustenance and, and a fixed kind of like uh, divine energy, which I would say would be the eternal, the understand the eternal, no matter what, or as John D would put it, the horizon of eternity, right? To understand that we live in these celestial, you know, energies, but also there's bigger celestial energies on top of that, which is bringing us to the ultimate celestial, which is the eternity of the divine, which is God. And that, mm that it takes levels of these spheres to understand, to get there. And if you don't understand and are aware of when you're going through chaos in your life or order and know the difference between both and then the difference of the other two, which are your own human nature and the divine art, then it's, it's pretty difficult. Or in those days, they would say, you will not find how to get to the divine higher realms. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a tension within Newton's life that, you know, that was his life. That, that's what kept him propelling forward, I think, was a tension between the chaos he obviously felt within himself and his desire to pursue that art and the art of uncovering the divine and always struggling to be divine enough himself to be worthy of uncovering the truth hmm. so he has a lot of repressing right um i mean actually one thing i should mention and i forgot to put a link to that here is he had a list when he was a child he wrote a list of sins that he was trying to forgive himself for i guess so he had a whole list of everything bad he'd ever said. So he was trying to purge himself of all of his sinful nature mm. by writing it and confessing to himself, because that would be a more Puritan, Puritan way of doing it, that you use your journal and your writing to work through your issues right. rather than having to go to a priest. So he had this long list of things from... Uh, thinking that he hated somebody, right? Right. To wanting to do something bad to a dog, like to kill a dog, or just thinking that he, he was aggravated by a dog, or he wanted to burn down, this was a famous one that psychologists have looked at, that he wanted to burn down his mother's house, because mother and stepfather's house. And So he's a little you know, like Forrest Gump doing that to Jenny's house with the tractor. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Or I mean, actually, Forrest Gump went ahead and did it, though. Yeah. But he didn't. But, you know. Yeah, he had a very Forrest Gumpian life, but he maybe achieved more. <laughs> yeah, so why don't, why don't you go like through, that. like, where his achievements start? So he's born uh, during the English Civil War, and it's rather young he starts coming up with some of the most radical changes in mathematics and and how, what we use today i mean that's what's pretty wild to me when looking at his stuff but wh where do you think he really got his big moment of really where he's recognized for the very beginnings of his work so when did he first yeah like what's his first to... big um mark for the world today well the big um where he became 
the most known was for his Principia, which is the treatise all about the laws of motion. And that was 1687. But um, he was one of those children who was just considered, I mean, he was basically a genius from a very young age, but he was born into a farmer's family, so he wasn't supposed to pursue education. So his mom always tried to fight him going into education, but then people in the community were, would um, make sure he could go to school because they saw how gifted he was. And apparently as a child, he um, had so many ideas inside of himself about how the world worked and what things he wanted to figure out that he was constantly taking, he's one of those people, kids who took, take, would take everything apart and put it back together mm -hmm. again and try to build useful things. And he was creating like water dams and doing innovative, interesting, fun things when his mom just wanted him to go and do his chores. All right. But he, so he was well ahead of his time and place and eventually people in his community saw that and wanted to send him to Cambridge. Right. His mom tried to make him be a farmer and he just let, I think, or I think it was a shepherd or a um, sheep herder. Mm. And he just kind of would go out and let the sheep go wherever. Right. He was a horrible, horrible farmer and sheep herder. And so hmm. maybe because he was so bad at it, his um, or maybe his mom maybe it was intentional because like Nostradamus, for example, at fifteen, uh, was denied to go uh, and expelled from school because using your hands was looked upon as not high enough class. Hmm. So maybe he never wanted to use his hands because using your hands back then wouldn't get you into college if you were mm -hmm. a farmer. Or a blacksmith I wonder if or, you thought about that, yeah, you know? because he was born into that sort of family, so he would have worked with his hands, and he, um, the only way he was able to go to Cambridge, he finally went in 1661, he'd made his way through grammar school, he, he failed at farming, and he was able to go to Cambridge because somebody paid for his fees to go, but even then, he was the poorest student there who was it um, that paid for him to go there were two men who lived in his community and mm. i don't remember if it was like the local clergyman which would be ironic or a school a schoolmaster type of person that's interesting because if we look just look at his chart for one okay. second um of course he's born january 4th 1643 which was actually just christmas on that um, right with the calendar calendar change correct and um, it's interesting because looking at his chart here, um, one is he has Pluto here that's sitting in the eighth house. And Pluto in the eighth house is definitely here to receive. But sometimes it could be a little bit secret and hidden, the investments that are made. And so it definitely brings me to uh, some interesting questions about his life about who funded him or who was really behind him throughout his whole life especially the way that it does that he does end in his life being knighted and so forth and being even buried with royals mm -hmm. and royalty yeah he was really sort of the first celebrity um where his I mean, you can still see his grave in Westminster Abbey, and um, it was it was like a whole monument. People thought he was so important, um, but but as for who is behind everything, right? So there were local people who believed in him, but also early on in his career, he met Robert Boyle, who was an aristocratic individual who was interested in chemistry, um, and he's thought of now as the founder of chemistry, but he was actually interested in alchemy. Um, and that was one of his early mentors as well. He, and he had um, Edmund Halley from Halley's Comet fame, who, mm -hmm. who also was an early supporter, and he's the one who uh, first learned of his mathematical 
innovations in that he created what became known later as calculus. And he's the one who convinced Newton to publish that work. Right. But that's not until the 1680s. Um, but he always did have other people who were well connected who were able to guide him in his career. Right. Well, and that's what's interesting is even his birth time. So I know some people in the chat, yes, he's born December 25th, but in the Julian calendar. So you run the chart for January 4th in the Gregorian. Mm -hmm. That's why it's on the 4th. Right. But it's interesting because um, his Rodin report, meaning in Astrodianist, to be able to see if the birth time is correct in A plus, right, or double A rating is for sure we have the time a c is uh it's hearsay but a lot of people did say at the time if we look down here um that um born an hour or two after midnight so you know there's some charts that have him as scorpio rising and others that have him as a libra rising at 26 degrees of libra i happen to go with that one by using different progressions and so forth to be able to get to where um, made Venus the ruler of his ascendant in Aquarius, which would make sense with how much he did with science and how much he did, he did with mathematics. Hmm. And it's also in a nice trine to that. And at 1.38 uh, a.m., which to me, between 1 and 2, I would already think 1.30, but a lot of people over the time of life using progressions and different things in astrology are able to, you know, come up with a a way to really you know look at this chart and actually go eh, i would say that it is 1 38 a.m but it's interesting because he's a capricorn and he was almost meant to be a sheep herder and he decided not to he has a full moon that was brewing right before he was born so you know just within about one day uh right before his birth of he was born right before a full moon but hmm. the moon was in Cancer, and it's in the ninth house here of wanting to expand in his life. And he felt more comfortable with seeking knowledge and seeking a place to go in life or an adventure that felt more comfortable for him than staying in his same environment and, and kind of sitting around in that environment. And he also does have a, a Jupiter in the fifth house with Saturn in Pisces, which is a very powerful alignment. We just had the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that's every 20 years. Um, at the end of 2020 and they're mm -hmm. big moments in life. And he's born with this alignment um, of Jupiter Saturn in his fifth house. So he's definitely in good aspect to his son. He wants to, to go explore his life and to go into the Pisces is the realm with no boundaries. So it's like he wanted to go find outside every boundary there ever was. So being a sheep herder would definitely not be a, a place he would have wanted to be. Mm hmm. But it's, again, my question about his chart is, is with Pluto in the 8th and Gemini. There's a lot of questions to who is always behind him hmm. in getting him to where to go. Like the fact that he had some random people in the town pay for his college. I right. mean, even today, that would be really weird. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, he would have probably been content to sit in a room and figure things out and use math to figure out all sorts of things for his whole life. Yeah. But it's sort of people, um, people saw what he was doing and couldn't believe what he had done, right? And so right. they didn't want him to not use that gift. But there's something about, what I think is interesting about Isaac Newton is he was painfully shy and uh, so introverted that you know, he had a mental breakdown later in his life um, after he'd been in the public eye. Like, he obviously had a huge social phobia. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, he was able to be prodded to go into public. So what is it about him that made it so he could get over his introversion like that? So he could be so painfully shy, but also venture out and then... And then after even feeling like he'd blown something or he was, he, he made people mad, he would still go out, go again. He would go back. Is that, 
I think it's an overactive mind in his chart. I mean, he does have the sun in the third house. Mm. He has Mercury in Sagittarius, which is actually a detriment. And for those that don't know, Mercury is ruled by Gemini and the opposite sign of being in Sag puts it in its detriment, which gives it a, a minus point. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing those two up is because, you know, having a sun in the third with this full moon that's beginning to apex in the ninth house, it's a, it's a lot of mental activity, especially with Venus and Aquarius, the ruler of his ascendant. He, so he's got, it's, it's almost like the mind finally reaches a point to where it needs to move. And so, okay, let's, let's actually see what happens instead of sitting behind and being in phobia too long. There's a point to where, okay, by just doing something and making a big change, especially Pluto in the eighth, they're extreme fears. Mm -hmm. And, uh, ironically enough, Hitler and Isaac Newton have the exact same rising in the same position and Pluto in the eighth house and Gemini in the exact same place. <laughs> and same thing happened with Hitler with having a mental breakdown and psychosis that happened to him. Mm -hmm. um, and how did he become a public figure with his social anxiety? He was always sitting in his, in his house that was up. Uh, uh, what was the name of that house? The, the, Ooh, the something loft or the eagles no i'm thinking no of something yeah else. The, the, yeah but it was up um, in austria that mm -hmm. that he sat in that house and most of the war he was up there it wasn't like he was in berlin all the time right mm -hmm. and so there was a social phobia especially with hitler at the same mm -hmm. time too the more and more that the that he was in public and the more and more he he went more into his social phobia mm -hmm. and he was like that too in his writing of mein Kampf while he was after the insurrection in prison is when he wrote it all out. So it, again, same thing with Isaac Newton. There was a writing it through the journal. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's where that third house for Isaac Newton is, is as long as he's writing it out or putting the mind into motion, into an actual place, mm -hmm. it's the release. I mean, I mean, you know, and that's what Hitler did with speaking though. Mm -hmm. and, but, but Hitler did write too. Uh, we know very well what he thought through Mein yeah. Kampf. You yeah, know. I wasn't shy about all of it. And, and what's funny is that in Mein Kampf, because we sat and read portions of it at one mm -hmm. point too, um, he treats it very logically, right? Very logically and, just, and serious as if there's mm -hmm. a importance to it where I feel like Isaac Newton's work, the way he was about being very Puritan, especially about divinity, would all be a way to get out of the social phobia almost as a kind of a heretic in a way, like um, giving, maybe it was him being a maverick that if there's some portion of my life as a person to be a maverick, it kind of gets you out of that. Mm -hmm. But then the repercussions of that or what people say about you or what, the response is, is always what then kind of is the retreat to then give you another excuse to come back. Mm -hmm. Usually I find in a lot of charts with people who have a lot of things to say and that make a lot of impact, at the same time dealing with the impact on the way back mm -hmm. is actually a loop cycle of how to get back into it. Is, is mm -hmm. There's actually a way to to keep doing that in order to find response and then deal with that and then find a way to, you know, let me, let me show you what I got now, you know? And if you look wow. at Isaac Newton's life at how many things it was like, it kind of, kind of reminds me of like, look, look what I just did now. Look what I just did now. Look what I just did now. Oh yeah. I figured that out. Oh, I got that done. Mm -hmm. Because one of the interesting things in um, Isaac Newton's life as a, being an astrologer is looking at by the time he was 22 years old, using uh, in astrology secondary progressions we just move the chart every year you're alive we just move the chart one day so 22 days after his birth venus stationed retrograde and that's a very big deal in the chart of sir isaac newton because he's born with libra on the ascendant and even if we don't know that's true if it was scorpio it's still a big deal uh, being born with venus stationing retrograde and uh, just 22 days after your birth, because that means that Venus is no longer moving forward. And of course, in his chart, uh, it's a big deal because when I looked up the history of him at 22 years old, he comes up with calculus. 
Right. And it, and, and to me, as an astrologer, I would say that this would have been the turning point in his identity in who he's defined as is, is, is from this core moment, which actually happened on the uh, exact date of December 3rd, 1665, um, that's when the station happened. Of course, it's the whole year of 1665 of the station, but the fact that it stationed retrograde on that date, from that date forward would have been where I would say as an astrologer, the, um, the launch pad of his rocket of his Venus Aquarius, which he has, which is very mathematical and very scientific and his values based upon intricate thought and being eccentric and doing things to solve also problems um, come to life because it's activated in such a unique and rare form. Hmm. And that, um, that's one reason you're able to say he must have been a, a Libra rising at that degree, right? Yes. Is because you were looking at where, when is Venus retrograded and it's exactly when he um, had to leave Cambridge. So he, he got to Cambridge, and while he's there, there is a plague that breaks out in London, and uh, uh, finally it reaches Cambridge, and all the students are told to go home. And um, he goes home and sits under the apple tree. <laughs> That's the, story, the legend, right? And sees an apple fall and thinks, oh, Things in motion are accelerating all the way down, and I can be able to measure exactly. Like the, that's what's so funny about his mind is that he wanted to be precise about knowing exactly how fast that's moving at every moment, right? Yeah, well, and I think especially that he comes up with calculus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so he comes up with calculus on his break when he's after he's sent home because right. of a plague. Which I brought this up to you when we were like comparing notes, Nostradamus at 15 goes to university, finally gets there, and then the plague hits and they tell him to go home. And he mm -hmm. spends eight years trying to find ways to find solutions to, to help people with medical, because it was that's where Nostradamus went, was to, to go into medical school. Mm -hmm. And so he tries everything to find cures for the bubonic plague. Now, mm -hmm. of course, this is over 100 years earlier, mm -hmm. but... Very interesting that the plagues have something to do with two very big characters and mm -hmm. being in college and having to go home and what they do with their lives with it after. Right. That it's actually almost like a divine intervention, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the plagues seem to be divine interventions in people's lives mm -hmm. where it's weird in society today, or even I would say, and maybe you could clarify that more, that most common people don't look at it as a divine intervention. They look at it as a hindrance. Right. Whereas to them, it was actually their launching points of who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And um, I don't know. I mean, it, it just suited those personalities, I guess, too. But, but for Isaac Newton, it's weird. I wonder if it was like this for Nost Nostradamus also. It was like going from the stimulation of an intellectual environment, because also at, at Cambridge for Newton, um, he, I think there was only one professor who could actually teach him anything mm. because he knew more than everyone else, because everybody was still studying Aristotle, which oh, was yeah. like the ancient, ancient wisdom. And, right. and Newton was interested in Galileo and the new things that were coming out. And right. Descartes, he was hugely influenced by Descartes. And so he kind of did a lot of his own learning, but was stimulated by that environment, I'm sure because it got him out of his, whatever he was doing before, <laughs> right. got him stimulated and interested. And then he's able to leave that and go home. It's like it triggered his mind again to be in, back in a different atmosphere again. Yeah, it's like the reflection of realizing, especially if you're saying that there was only one professor he was interested in because mm -hmm. he was bored by the others. It reminds me of Nostradamus being very um, judged for not being um, of a higher class, mm -hmm. that there is a little maverick or a little bit of a, a, a rebellious energy of like, well, let me go figure out how to cure the plague, right? <laughs> or Isaac Newton, yeah, 
Well, I figured calculus. Let me figure this out. Nobody's doing this. Right. Right. There is kind of the, well, I guess nobody there even knows what the heck's going on. Let me go figure out mm -hmm. it on my own. But he, and he was happy just to do it on his own. Like I have a picture here. I don't know if Brian can show it. It's um, Newton's calculations. It's one page from a notebook. And that was just entertainment where he is figuring things out that many times just because he's interested in it. And he has pages and pages and pages of notebooks like this. And he was figuring out everything, you know. Um, in today's world, you know, if you were to do that, they would probably throw you in a mental hospital and throw you in with some sort of medication. Right. Well, and I wonder why, what's interesting is he ended up in the right place too, where he had the time and, you know, materials to do that, right? That, um, and he made use of whatever he had to do this and people did not consider him to be just a crazy person <laughs> because right. he was, he was doing all of this just because, not because he wanted to prove anything, it was like he needed to know it. Well, I would say it's kind of interesting at that 22 years old at this chart, his progressed son, 22 days after his birth, was at seven degrees Aquarius, squaring his Mars and Taurus. So I, I, I feel that um, whenever you have the progressed son squaring a, or your natal Mars. Mm -hmm. Mars and the sun in astrology are the only two energies of defining identity, ego and soul identity. And so when that comes into a, cr a clash, it's almost like he does secretly, he might come across that he doesn't have something to prove, but it's more like he wants to prove his value with Mars being in Taurus that life. And it might take a little bit of time because if you look at his life, it's he takes the time to do it. He'll write the numbers. He'll go through the, the, the equations. He'll go through things. But with that son Aquarius, it's like he wants to prove something that's, that's valuable, but also that's way different than anybody's doing and way eccentric. Like he, it's like that, that, that would have been a driving force for him at that 22 years of birth. Like he would have been, okay, I've got to do something. And the pressure also does do, what are you going to do? Like, so there would have been an energy, what are you going to do? And are you going to do something of value and something different? Or are you just going to follow the sheep literally of life <laughs> and find your value in just doing what everybody else does? That, that would have been an actual feeling for somebody like him at that moment. That really, to me, it's that, 22 years for him mm -hmm. where that was his turning point. Hmm. Wow. And I wonder if it hadn't been a plague, it would have been something, but I right. guess he was born at a time when there was a plague. So, right. you know, that's well, and it, ironically the him. return of a plague, right? Like the yeah. country, you know, just, just a, century before that uh, was was dealing with it so mm -hmm. it, it, it was the re, it was like coming back how they do today right it's like oh no another variant and da, 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 da. <laughs> then it would have been like you know well, wasn't that a long time ago well it's back again right well it had to be a lot to make people leave back then right. too because disease was rampant everywhere the, i mean this is a time when it's interesting because Newton lived to be 84 years old, I think. And it was at a time when you could die so many ways. Half of the babies born in London in a year would have died. Right. Right. So um, there was a lot of disease. I mean, that's, it, it's just it didn't have to be a plague. But the plague was so contagious. And, you know, they knew they, they could prevent it somewhat if people did, did go home. Yeah, I feel like also the fact that he was born with um, Uranus and Scorpio in his first house, I feel like it's his identity to be different, but he is a, he loves to try and find what is the buried treasure of things that are undiscovered. Mm -hmm. And that his identity is very eccentric. So he would have also I mean, I don't know if you could show a picture of him, but you know, when anybody has Uranus in the first house, they don't look normal. 
They look eccentric. They look different. They look like a wild person or a genius or somebody who is odd sometimes, right? Like, mm -hmm. like somebody who doesn't look like the average Joe per se, but especially in Scorpio there, there's also, um, where it's exalted because it's, uh, it's a commitment to the, the search for, you know, solving yeah. problems through looking in areas that everybody else isn't looking in a deeper realm or a place behind the normal world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's digging into the occult as well. It's digging into uh, his deepest passions and, yeah, and, he and finding him. He did that to the exclusion of anything else. So he had um, people who lived with him as, as like laboratory assistants and they would, and anyone who observed him working would say he rarely stopped to even eat, right? He, most of the time they would come in, I think he slept, they said that he slept like four or five hours. He worked and worked and worked and worked. <laughs> um, and he, or he experimented right? The only thing he would do is go outside in his garden a little bit each day, and then he barely even ate. And so it, he really seemed odd to a lot of people. Um, and he looked strange. I mean, like that, that picture, he, he, people would have remarked that he looked a little bit odd. So yeah, that portrait of him, I could see where some people might have put him as Scorpio rising because he has kind of a dark feature to him. Like if you look at his eyes and mm. the way that if you were to look at his eyes, there's a, it's more of the Uranus Aquarius eyes to me. And the Libra comes out, I think, more in the sense that, you know, he he wants to be an intellect. He is an intellectual. He's he's And he also is somebody who goes to his garden. So no matter how crazy it is, with Uranus and Scorpio to dig up all this stuff and work and not sleep as much. There is the, the Libran <laughs> quality of yeah. let me go into my garden and try and find my connection to divinity or peace or mm -hmm. I don't know if he was a Rosicrucian or not, but yeah, that's one of the things that Michael White says in his book, the, the last sorcerer, he says that Newton was a Rosicrucian mm. or that he followed the ideas of Rosicrucians and People like Robert Boyle, the early chemist I just mentioned, also followed that philosophy. And he makes the case that the Royal Society, which is the society established to study science in England, he says that its principles come from the principles of the Rosicrucians as well. Hmm. Yeah, because I was going to say like that he would have found time to probably meditate or connect to the divinity in that garden and probably wanted his own space because in rosicrucianism it's you must find your own space to correctly connect to the divine hmm. that um you know it's about what you do individually to understand yourself of course there's rituals and there's temple stuff to do but it's much more of you you have to do that work on your own and in your own space which also Uranus in the first house can kind of be a loner, even be surrounded by people though, and kind of, you know, oh, like I need your help and whatever. And then just, where did you go? You know, <laughs> uh, you know, like, and be very much that way. Mm -hmm. um, he has one of those charts that I look at and I'm, I'm very, I'm very interested in it because he's, he's really spread out. He's got planets all over the place. Um, but to me, I feel like his, biggest secret is or is his secret life that there was other life there was another part of it all that would have been either his it would have been hard for him to have communication um correctly about deeper things and it's almost like his work was um a really good smoke screen of of like what he was always doing but he had other thoughts and other things and i didn't even know until we just did this that you said that he used to write like oh, i wanted to tear down or burn down my mother's house or whatever. And Pluto in the eighth house can be definitely be a lot of anger and rage or jealousy or, or, you know, some of those darker shades of emotion, but it also at the same time definitely deals, especially with Chiron in conjunction there 
it's ironic, his Chiron and my Chiron are one degree apart. Hmm. Um, in Gemini, uh, he never feels like, uh, he's always trying to prove through his intellectual qualities um, that, it, that he has a lot there, but it's almost like he feels like it's not maybe seen in his own mind, but it, it, it might actually be. Mm -hmm. That's the whole weird thing about Chiron and Gemini is his thoughts are his, his biggest wound. And in the eighth house, it's like too afraid to express what he really thinks. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's almost like, okay, doing calculus or coming up with the theory of, of relativity, gravity, even he, he's the one who basically put the stamp of guarantee of the heliocentric model of the, the procession of the equinoxes, understanding different comets, understanding so much mm -hmm. when it comes to the solar system and, and that, no, the Earth is not the center of it all. So he, he's the one who puts the stamp mathematically of procession of equinoxes and understanding what we see with that, no, that there is a procession. There is a 23-degree backwards energy from the zodiac and the constellations. He's the one who puts the stamp of the approval that basically Galileo's work in Copernicus He's the one who is the stamp of approval that it's for sure this. Mm -hmm. He's the only one that actually mathematically proves it all. Right. And actually shows that it really does work. Mm -hmm. But his real thoughts about things, that's the real interesting part to me. It's, it's always his work, but it's, it's not like uh, you used Trump earlier as an example. We know what Trump thinks. Right. I don't know if in his work he ever deviated from the work and ever went into his personal beliefs. or And that's really what he wanted to do. I'd say his biggest struggle in his life was his personal beliefs with Mercury and Sag and Neptune and Sag in the second house of his values that go against his Pluto Chiron in the eighth of like his deep, his deeper, um, you know, stuff he wants to expose. It's almost like, you know, there's maybe doesn't want to be ashamed of them or uh, be shamed for bringing them out at the same mm -hmm. time too. Yeah. Um, and I'm not even talking about his work, but much more of his own personal life mm -hmm. or his personal, personal beliefs of how the world was going in, in that time or how life was. Um, that would have been a challenge for him extremely. And, and it, it does become a challenge. As you say, he does enter into a phase where they say that he, um, becomes, what was the term, uh, that he loses, I guess, loses his mind or has, they say a mental has breakdown, a, a nervous breakdown, nervous breakdown. Yeah. yeah. Which, um, to me, uh, it was around 1691, I think you said, or 1693 is when he, they say they have the letters of him. But uh, as an astrologer looking at his progressions, uh, he had his progressed sun square Pluto at that time, his progressed sun trying the moon. And I also did a deeper dive and I went into uh, the transits for him in 1691 with the progressed sun square Pluto. And it was right when Uranus transiting was on his Pluto. And I wanted to use a reference to Hitler, Adolf Hitler, in 1943 is the exact time that Uranus was in Gemini and it went and crossed over the natal Pluto of Hitler. And by this time is when there is a lot of um, work that was done in 1943 that Hitler was on the fringe, uh, hysterical, was a, a hysterical at the edge of schizophrenia. Um, and that there was work done and there was also a lot of talk about the psychosis that was going on that really peaked for him coming into 1943. When the war was starting to be lost, they lost the North African front. Things were not going well with the Russian front. Mm -hmm. uh, things started falling apart. And uh, even the beginning of the allies in, the, in that war started coming to all of his occupied territory around Europe. So it's kind of interesting to see the astrology at work for somebody born with Pluto and Gemini in the eighth house. And that's a crazy place, Pluto and Gemini. It's a, it's a mental, you know, fear, uh, in an intense mind, but with an intense mind comes phobias, fears, and also you're going to have to deal with a mind that is not, um, 
normal. It is extreme. And so I, it reminds me of a Lamborghini. It's a great car, but the maintenance is expensive and it doesn't run efficiently all the time. Mm -hmm. So when it does run, it runs great. But when it breaks down, it breaks down hard. Wow. Well, he definitely did have a major breakdown. Um, 1693 uh, was the year that he, I was trying to find, sorry, I didn't realize this was on. <laughs> Let me scroll down a little more slowly. 1693 is what a lot of people have called his black year, meaning it was his year of depression. Uh, he had his breakdown in September of that year. And in his breakdown, he, um, what he did was write some letters to his close friends, John Locke, who a lot of people know as one of the people that our founding fathers were influenced by mm -hmm. from a lot of his works on politics and society. Um, he was a friend of Newton's and also a diarist named Samuel Pepys. Uh, another man, um, Newton wrote them both letters that were paranoid and he was accusing them of treating them wrongly. For John Locke, he accused him of trying to seduce him with women because John Locke was known as being more of a womanizer of his day. And there he, oh, mm -hmm. I had his picture up, but uh, he kind of looks like Isaac Newton there on the, on the left. Um, but he was a womanizer, and Newton was obsessed with maintaining his purity, but also could have been hiding his sexuality, which we can go into. Um, well, because also this man on the right was a... Um, a Swiss mathematician who he met and had a little bit of an infatuation with as well. And they exchanged letters that show that there was really, there were intense feelings between them. So that was happening right before this breakdown. Mm. And it kind of all happened in 1693 where Newton had that breakdown. Right. And I think I was telling you that I feel like it was the years prior mm -hmm. that was a buildup. He right. also, um, if we look at his progressed new moon that happened, it happened in 1688 at the last degree of Aquarius going into Pisces. So he basically had a progressed new moon at 45 in 1688. And then he comes into his crescent moon phase there in 1691 when this progressed sun squares Pluto, which is a very extreme transit of fear base and also trying to come to terms with his desires and his wants and his needs, and especially in the eighth house of sexuality. And in Gemini, it's a battle of his mind of it, right? And especially you bring up the Puritan aspect of it because it's progressed new moon squared Neptune in his chart. So that means that he's in conflict with his Puritanism, his desires, and it would have all just been going intense from 88 through uh, 1688 through 16, uh, pretty much 83, because that's right when the last quarter of, uh, or sorry, that's a 80, 83. Yeah, that's right after his crescent phase between his uh, crescent and first quarter. And if you look back at his life, at his progressed new moon, he had one uh, at 16. And then it was right when the plague happened and he comes up with calculus was during his first quarter. Um, and it was right on his Mars. Um, so it's, it's interesting that looking also too for his life he has his new moon at uh, 45 years old and then the first quarter is in 1695 so two years before it's that phase kind of like the same way he was in between searching for himself and what to do but this time it was much more based around his soul and what he would what, who it what really was his assault was a soul breakdown basically mm -hmm. Of, of his puritanism and his values against his desires. And it would have been very extreme for him. I also was able to look um, and use lifetime arcs and look at his lifetime arcs. And it was that his lifetime arced to two degrees of Gemini and conjuncted his Pluto in 1690 of December. And so this would have brought him into why I'm trying to put up the point astrologically that 1690 to 1691 would have been when these extreme, especially based off his puritanism, his, his extreme desires came into his huge focus. 
And if we were to see in 1693, and you said September, mm -hmm. but he had his conjunction with his uh, lifetime arc sun uh, on Aldebaran, which is a major uh, fixed star. And that's, of course, the star of, of Michael, uh, you know, because it's dealing with Archangel Michael. So there's that another Puritanism aspect that's in conflict with that, uh, you know, and that's what makes me kind of interested about his real, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to put it this way. I know he did alchemy, but I also know that he was very into Christianity in his own way, a Puritanism, but there's a conflict of interest of both because in alchemy, you know, you see people connecting with it in the old days. But again, it wasn't so much based upon, let's say, Jesus per se. It was much more in Yeshua, right? Or it was much more based upon just the divine God, right? Mm -hmm. And they pretty much weren't going to churches and practicing it in the 1500s and already had wrote off the Catholic Church in many ways, a lot of them, like Robert Flood and all that. They, were, they, they, they weren't in conflict with it. So Aldebaran is God's military commander, and if you're on the side of good, then it gives you the power to do the things of good and you won't be judged if you're doing it for good, including your desires or whatever, because that's what's interesting is he had a way of getting people to follow his work and to attract people to it, but it's almost like he had a very deep conflict with where that, uh, that energy of attracting energy to him when it came to his romantic life, if you were to think of his chart, he would have definitely had some issues with that, with Mars being in his seventh house of relationships in Taurus, which it's that detriment. And it's an Aries, so it's the ruler of his seventh house. He would have definitely, his identity-based energy of his values were based upon the relationships. And I don't know if anybody ever had the values that he had so set so high that it was like he probably would have, whether it was a woman or a man tried to be in a relationship with them, he would have been not, you're not, you're not pure enough. You're not good enough. You're not this enough. You're not that enough. Mm -hmm. You're not this enough. You're not that enough mm -hmm. and caused a lot of strife uh, because of his own stuff. And then dealing with that on his own, he also has the South node in Aries and he had a North node in Libra, meaning in this life for him, it was about learning to find connection and learning how to find relationships. But it looks like he spent a lot of his time alone with that South node in Aries and so it's kind of a sad life whenever you see somebody with a South Node in Aries and them being so independent and on their own because they're really just stuck in the cycle of staying in themselves constantly. And, and especially in the sixth house of his, of his work and spirituality, you know, was I think he found his bliss through spirituality, but it was like God, God wants us to have partners, you know, and it's almost well, he, like he, weird that he had issues with that. Yeah. But he did have partners, and the way that you described it makes me think of 1691 is also the year that Robert Boyle died. Oh. And Robert Bo Boyle was his trusted mentor, and he had friends who practiced either who did math with him or who were sort of the secret alchemy friends. Mm. And Robert Boyle was one of those. Um, he actually... Um, well, I have something I can show you of his, yeah, his alchemical work. He started in 1669. And this was a quote I thought was very interesting um, where he said, alchemy does not trade with metals as ignorant vulgars think. So people, ignorant people would think, oh, it's just about metals. And he says, well, error. Yeah, the eye of the vulgar is what John D says. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. um, which error has made them distress that noble science. This philosophy is not of that kind, which tends to vanity and deceit, but rather to profit and to edification, inducing first the knowledge of God, and secondly, the way to find out true medicines in the creatures. The scope is to glorify God in his wonderful works, to teach a man how to live well. So that's from his alchemical writings that people didn't know about, right? So we haven't known about this until really the 20th century hmm. that a lot of these papers were found. But if you, um, if you could go back to that um, picture where it shows his name, the name of the person 
who supposedly wrote this was Jehovah Sanctus Unus, or One Holy God, which was an anagram of Isaac Newton's name, Latinized. Mm -hmm. So this was something he would have written and exchanged with his alchemical buddies, right? So he had a really close group of people who spoke his language that he must have really felt a strong connection with. Right. And I mean, that also is his, his uh, notebook, his alchemical notebook, just to show right. you that he was, uh, you know, well, heavily involved in it. Yeah, and there's the planets mm -hmm. in all of them. And those are the s different spheres too. But it's also interesting that even when we think of the periodic table in science, the original one was alchemical. So it had Mercury, mm -hmm. the actual planet, and the, the actual like hieroglyphics of it, right? Mm -hmm. We're not what you see today of like M-E, right? You actually saw glyphs. Oh, yeah. And I, I mean, somewhere that I was, was looking at pictures of, of Newton's own table like that. Oh, he really? He had his own um, table. Is there any way to wrote. see that? I'll have to, I'll look for it. Well, but yeah, that's, that's, that's the interesting part though, is I feel again, I mean, a soul that has a third and ninth house and a second and eighth house opposition that's really intense, you know, he's got a lot of beliefs. Then he changes his mind on them. And then he has values that he has a lot of values that change at the same time. Well, then demonizing his own self, he can self demonize himself really fast. It could be the gl most glorious thing that he's come up with. And then, oh God, I, I, I no, 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 no. And I would say that that would have been his lifelong battle is, is, is finding some sort of consistency, which I think was the math for him. Mm -hmm. But I think when he dipped his toes into religion, when he dipped his toes into the more philosophy aspects, his moods, his moon and cancer were all over the place. So I would say that he would not have been a very consistent emotional person when it came to his philosophies. They would have changed a lot and people would have been like, oh, didn't you say that at one time? Yeah, but now look at this, you know. Hmm. But that's with evolution too and to be uh, innovative and genius. But there would have been a big disconnect, I would say, with Venus being in Aquarius for him in the fourth house. Again, that's another inconsistent place for him emotionally. Mm -hmm. That He actually battled a lot of very inconsistent emotions. Huh. There was not a lot of stable emotions. I think I had read one thing when he actually uh, came into the uh, when he came into Parliament that he really wouldn't talk except like uh, it's really cool and it really uh, close that window. Close please. that window, <laughs> right? Like, and that yeah. was like all people remember him saying. So it was like uh, I'm sure there could have been a bill or something that came up, and he just like, did you close the window, <laughs> right? So it's like yeah. Like, like what, what's really going on under there, Isaac? But I'm sure people actually would have not really, with Mars in the seventh, that goes to battles with people. So again, more of the secret stuff, or maybe, you know, history is kind of hard to write all the personal stuff because mm -hmm. you have to go off the records that are written or so forth. But I would say that he would not have been a very friendly, approachable person. So he had all this stuff seething underneath the surface. Yeah, very much so. At people, but you know, his spiritual spiritual beliefs would have made him suppress it because he would have seen that he would have, he grew up in a time when that kind of anger directed at people. If you had any puritanical leanings, that was not okay. Right. So it would so. have been. Well, think of Hitler, right? He had Mars in the seventh house. He had Pluto in the eighth. The Gemini. He had a labor rising. And you know what it was like? Do you think people like to approach Hitler? <laughs> No, he looked like it so. on, on camera. He was the first, you know, videoed, you know, big right. speaker. And on top of that, you know, he, he came across at the beginning. He would shake the kids' hands and he used to kiss them like Biden and sniff their hair. <laughs> but then eventually people were just like, I don't want to be around that guy. Like, I don't know. He might attack. And he, you know, he used to, he used to fire generals right away and just be like, no, 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 let's get you the blitz crowd. And then, no, no, you know, like there was a lot of, you know, and he had his loyalists, like you say, that did the math with him and so forth, but they didn't even feel loyal because he was more loyal to his astrologer who made his morning alchemical concoction in the morning that was at his own private estate 
than he was his own generals or even Eva von Braun or any of the people that were around him. It was like, what, what, the, or his doctor, his doctor was his number one person. Oh, you, he was at one point in his life where he was taking over 30 medications a day, right? Mm -hmm. And that doctor was not that great of a doctor, but became, became, wanted to be part of the Nazi party and found Hitler right at the beginning of him becoming, um, you know, well, Chancellor that turned into the Fuhrer. But uh, yeah, like got in and was like, what do, what do you want me to give you? Why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? And Hitler loved that. So people that, you know, there would have been favorites, but it would have also looked like these are the favorites, but really he had his like little personal favorites, mm -hmm. Pluto and the Eighth, like the ones that it's like, wait, who's this person? Oh, don't, don't mind that person. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> don't mind that person back there. <laughs> Right? Like, well, what do you mean? Like, who is this guy? Like, Newton you know what I mean? He had his sidekick who was always there, you right. know, um, who was always helping him with his lab experiments. They lived in the same rooms for 20 years. So some people have said he was his actual partner. But <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that Pluto in the eighth would have done. And I think, think of Hitler with Eva uh, Bra Braun, right? Mm -hmm. That was a very weird partnership it was not your ultimate like lover or like married lover like there was like she was just a woman who kind of came along and if i forgot the history there was something about like she was married at one time and then kind of like yeah, left somebody so. and mm -hmm. ended up with hitler and she was just kind of there it's just like it kind of reminded yeah, so sort of super that. similar there's and i know that people might for forever be like that is just crazy but i'm not saying that they're the same people or they do the same things right but that their energy of the soul and how they would act especially around relationships that that's an area that you know he would have had a lot of difficulty with and and expressing his true needs and wants and feeling that nobody gave him fully what he wanted he probably would have been a like a beggar a little bit in his private life like you're not giving me enough sex <laughs> well you're not giving I me enough just love him as, but but i always thought maybe he just equated math with sex Right, because I was just about to say, like, you didn't turn the right direction at the right angle for the amount, right amount of time. <laughs> like, so what? He was, he was probably taking calculations. Or he was probably in love with somebody who was fascinated enough with, was that enough? Of the, was the calculus correct? <laughs> who knows what they were measuring? <laughs> right? Like, but that was, that was an interesting part of, uh, of Hitler, too. Like, he was very fascinated with art. He had an upset. There's obsessions with Pluto in the eighth. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering like, what was his obsessions? Like, was it the garden or was it, you know, I guess it, it, he's a third house son. So it was in his work. Right. And it was in his math mm -hmm. and it was in doing all this stuff. And then mm -hmm. he ends up going into working for the mint. Right. And, and, and which is kind of a boring job and just, but it was there was so much specific detail there for that but um i wanted to point out too one more of his obsessions was looking at the bible and calculating everything he could calculate about the bible like when is christ coming again when will be the end of the world or when was he says you know, 2060 is going to be the end of the world isaac newton yeah so we'll see if he's right but he calculated everything, and, and I have, there's a chart that somebody created um, that shows his timeline regarding Daniel's prophecy. So this was um, a book in the Bible, and they've just taken it to show all of his calculations. Newton observed that the 70 weeks and 62 weeks were Jewish weeks ending with sabbatical years, and he also believed the final seven weeks were the compass of a jubilee and begin and end with actions proper for a jubilee. So here's um, the years. Uh, Christ returns on a sabba Sabbath year, 49 years after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. So I guess Christ should have been here already. The Christ was born here. between 67 and 69. Or 49 years after, right? 49, so he would be, if Christ was here, he'd be like 50 years old now. So, or no, he would have been born. Oh, Christ now. returns on a Sabbath year, 49 years after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, so yeah, that but would have I mean, been the year of, if, if 
30, so 33 is 2000, and then another 10 years is 2010, so 2019. Is when Christ was born, right? So is what he's saying is when Christ mm-hmm. would be born. So who knows? In a few years, we'll see. Um, but this is just a small thing. And if you look at his calculations, it's just written all over pages of everything in the Bible he could calculate. And he wrote more on this biblical calculus than he did anything else. And I or mean, this is kind of, you know, I, I mean, can I, I, sorry to interrupt you, but all right. if, if, if that saying Christ returns doesn't mean after the decree to rebuild, it doesn't mean a birth like a baby, but that Christ has returned. Oh, and I yeah. think of 2019 as the year in which, you know, there would have been a crazy energy. I mean, if you think that was the year that Trump was persecuted so much, the impeachments, right? Um, I mean, you know, you could look at, I don't know if he gave specifics of what that would look like, but like Jesus being crucified again, like Trump being persecuted, and maybe that's why a lot of people look to him kind of like Christ Mm -hmm. returning in many ways. Some people do at least. Mm -hmm. I would say if you were to pick one person in the world that Christians believe returned Christ. They actually, I would say that if you were to do a poll, they would say Trump. Hmm. And I get, you guarantee you, they would have said 2019 is the year of like, wait, what? The Russia collusion thing was okay and all that. And they go after him over Ukraine, like, you know, in 2019, they're investigating him mm-hmm. again. And it's like, right? Like, that's kind of, I'm not saying it's true. I'm just like saying, like, that's kind of an interesting. Yeah, and I mean, astrologically in 2019, that's the year, uh, Is that's not the Saturn-Jupiter, that's 2020. It's the buildup of 2020's Saturn-Pluto conjunction, which changed the world and brought on the the new plague and all those things. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, I mean, we were talking about this before we started tonight, whether or not Isaac Newton was an astrologer or, you know, whether or not he followed astrology. Um... And I think we'd read that, or both of us had heard that he thought it was not a true science. But there are so many principles that um, are the same as the alchemical ideas. And Newton was so sure, too, he really believed in the idea of as above, so below, which is why he believed if we understand motion on Earth, if we understand the nature of motion on Earth, we understand it in the cosmos. So that's, you know, where his greatest um, ideas about laws of motion and and all that come from. And it is a very similar idea to the astrological oath that you were showing me as well. Yeah, I'll show this. This is what Google says, though. That in addition, there is no other evidence connecting Newton to astrology. Indeed, if he had practiced astrology, he would have needed many books. This sounds like a intellectual right? Like he, Hmm. what, like if he was a medical doctor, he would need all the medical doctor books that sit behind a doctor or a lawyer that sits behind them where he had four books. Do you need more? No, but like, you know, like medical genius. Right. And then they go on to say, we have to conclude that Newton was not an astrologer, but he was not a simple rationalist scientist either. So at least they leave, they leave it Mm open-ended. Right. But you know, that was in secret. Look at that. So this is from uh, in the Netherlands. I'll actually tr- trust a school from the Netherlands, mm-hmm. especially a Dutchman. Um, that they're saying that he did astrology in secret. Yeah, I would think that. I mean, you have to wonder. Actually, so much of the Bible, um, it's mathematically based, but so much is also from astro- um, astrology or astronomy, right? that's in the Bible already. So if he's calculating from the Bible, it would have been astrologically based as well. But I can't believe he wouldn't have investigated it because astrology is math, right? And that's what he did. Yeah, and they're saying that when they analyzed his library, he had no more than four books. Um, 
but he had secret investigations. The study into Newton's unpublished papers mentioned above have revealed that during the greater part of his scientific career, his secret passions, in fact, lay in alchemy in matters of theology, such as the nature of the Holy Trinity and the dimensions of Solomon's temple, which are very um, connected to Rosicrucianism and even Freemasonry, mm -hmm. uh, biblical prophecies and biblical chronology. Um, Oh, wow. When Dr. Halley ventured to say anything disrespectful to religion, he invariably checked him with the remark, I have studied these things you have not. <laughs> See, I told you he would have been that way. Right? Like, well, the, oh, I guess I don't know. Can handle it. it. That's so funny. Right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it looks like it would have been from what they were saying here. However, in the case, the astrological literature presents a different view and even claims that Newton was in secret and ardent student of astrology. Um, so it's funny that it's a big question and, and using his astrology. Yeah, he's, there's things in secret and even Hitler himself persecuted astrologers with the Jews. They were the first to go like into the camps. Astrologers were. And then when one of Hitler's most trusted men at the time flew to London to give information and, and, he, and he broke the ranks. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. It was all based upon an astrological moment. Right. And it was, it was weird because they were pulling people out of camps that were great astrologers to help them win the war, and including Hitler, right? And Hitler's most trusted person that I'm saying was the most secret that gave him a daily concoction of an alchemical drink for him to drink was an astrologer using the astrology. And he even had his own telescope. Hitler did? H Hitler did at up there in Austria. Yeah. At the, I'm, I was dad, at the wolf's nest or yeah. The, 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 <laughs> and I can't believe yeah. I can't remember the name of it because my dad visited there and I always hear the story about how he went. I I'm pretty sure that's where he went. I know. And I worked with and the FBI on that program and um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hitler's um, Austria um, home. It was uh, the Berghof, yeah. And at the Berghof, he did have, we, I got to see the plans and I got to connect it with the plans that the Nazi party in 33 in LA were going to build that home that was going to be the home of the Nazi party for Hollywood in LA, where we now know as the Getty Museum. Mm -hmm. And that Hitler had a whole telescope and an observatory built at, the Berghof. Hmm. And that's upstairs where his astrologer lived, just how Isaac Newton had somebody live with them for so long. That was in secret. That was that was way like like you don't go in that room. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you don't go like you don't go well, up there. That's my little student studying calculus, <laughs> and you know what I mean? Like what? And Newton had um, Maybe that would have been back. weird, like, you know, uh, if a, a, a fair lady came over to meet Isaac Newton and he took her over and then she went in the wrong door. Don't go in that room. And he had a little <laughs> guy in there doing math, like looking up like, <laughs> you're not supposed to be in here. Oh, like whips and chains and stuff. So he did, <laughs> like, you know, he did have um, <laughs> the, his little rooms. I have a picture of the rooms, but it doesn't show the shed. Um his rooms were right here and it's so funny because they were right next to the chapel of trinity college and there was supposedly a shed i guess actually that you can kind of see the shed right there where he did his alchemical ah. um, work so it was this little secret area here that they that his little friend would have been in there all the time helping him with his experiments and there's a picture here also of a fire that broke out in there. And then this is actually one of his um, notes from that. So a lot of his work from that period of time, like 1670s, was lost in this fire. That was because he left a candle burning when, mm. and, and supposedly his dog knocked it over. So he had a dog too. We know that. Um, and I hope he survived the fire because they don't say that part. Uh, so, so yeah, he definitely had a little laboratory with the secret guy behind the curtain. 
And the other thing I was thinking of, you know, I'm not, not that I want to continue the comparison with, um, with Hitler, but think about the fact that Hitler did have those close, the close group of generals or whoever they were of SS men. And it was really so much more about the male companionship um, that he enjoyed hanging out with the people who shared his views and who were mm. helping him do his twisted view of what would save civilization, right? right? And it was helping him carry out a very distorted Libra dream of saving the world for art and whatever else he thought he was doing. Where So let's go to Newton, who is living at a different time where he's not going to develop similar distorted views. But he, again, he's more comfortable around his pack of guys, too, who all believe in this um, sort of this philosophy that is not accessible to everybody. It's like the secret knowledge. They both kind of had a little cult of secret knowledge around them. Hmm. Well, here I was able to find some pictures of um, Hitler with telescopes. That's so interesting because, you know, Newton made a telescope right. that he's famous for making the, is it refracting telescope? Although this was that. from the army, which was propaganda city. So that's the same as a Joe Biden kind of picture. Like It's just so weird. Look at my telescope, little boy. But I think when, when you know when when you think of Isaac Newton and tel a telescope was a huge part for him in his life to study all these things, mm -hmm. especially from an astrological point of view and the heliocentric part of the work that he did. To me, it's the precession of the equinox to be able to actually give the math to actually calculate that and make that a guarantee is what gives life to the understanding of the difference between whether you want to look at that as the sidereal zodiac or Vedic astrology and the Western tropical astrology without his work, it's not a, there is no like, um, math to differentiate that. And so it's actually what helps us understand the ages at the same time too. Hmm. So if you really think that the understanding of ages does go back longer, but to get the mathematical aspect to it that's through isaac newton even though that's not talked about a lot right it's always gravity or even the calculus or the the way that the relativity works right that we still use today in nasa but i think in today's world we need more people who are using they're not they're not blacklisting certain things they're, they're willing to take in religion alchemy science mm -hmm philosophy, theology, and, and bridge them all together to, to find the results. And I feel like the more that, I mean, if you think of the science community today, it, it's very one dimensional, mm -hmm. or even the religious societies today, they're very one dimensional, where none of them are coming together right now at all. And actually, you know, it was Kanye West or Yee who just brought up on Tucker Carlson, because we're doing this on October 7th on the 6th, he, he said, when he got asked about Elon Musk, he says, I like Elon because he's wanting to come up with all these ideas. He goes, I would have him at the White House sleeping every day. And he says, but I would, because he started touting that he's going to be president one day. He said, I would have all the best thinkers like in Rome back in the old days all together. And that he even said that they used to have the toilets underneath them while they would talk, that they wouldn't even leave to use the bathroom. They would just use the bathroom and I, talk. I wonder what Isaac Newton did for the bathroom, by the way. Right? That's interesting. But I think it's interesting that Kanye West mm -hmm. brought that up because it's like we're in a time to where wouldn't you think with the craziness of, uh, you know, Armageddon that the president's touting right now since the, the, we're the closest to it since JFK and the Cuban Missing Crisis or, f you know, the food issues around the world or the medical issues around the world or... Uh, the instability of people and their trust in government at the time, that you would get the best people in the world to start coming up with solutions and talking through these things or the big questions that the people have. Because it is leading to, I think, not a nation civil war, but the understanding of kind of a global kind of like 
place we've never gone before where it's it's like a revolution and a civil war all combined like it's kind of like a a remapping of how the world should go and that you know there's these very small group of people out there in the world and then there's like this the, the populace which is massive that are, are are against kind of this globalization uh, movement at the moment or centralizing and it's weird that Isaac Newton was born with the breakaway from centralization from a monarch mm -hmm. and um, that, you know, he, the people that were before him, you know, Galileo, he, he got jailed for questioning mm -hmm. the work that right. Newton proved, mm -hmm. right? Or even Robert Flood or any of these people that were also into alchemy, but they were also spiritual, they were also religious, they were also all these things had to hide where he got them. He kind of got the big moment to finally not have to hide so much and didn't have to really, because after the civil war, that's where they install a new monarch. That's more flexible with the people. Right. And so he doesn't have to worry about a church. He doesn't have to worry about the monarch as much. And he can kind of be a little Uranus in the first Tau Scorpio and kind of get away with it more than his predecessors before him. Mm -hmm. And we're living in a world right now which is more connected to the 1500s than it is the 1600s, unfortunately. And so you see people today afraid to post on their Instagram what they feel without being blocked or, or censored. You see people that don't even have an outlet to go give what they want out, right? Mm -hmm. If you put up the title wrong or you put up something incorrect you have a fact checker on you or you you get striked or you get banned or if you go out in public and do it you know you you have to worry about now antifa coming and destroying your belief and making it look like it's a bad movement um so he's, he's kind of where i think we're going but unfortunately i think we're we're a little bit of a ways from that place um to have enough people like Isaac Newton who will incorporate all these things and mm -hmm. not be afraid to do them. I, I also had researched that, you know, the Catholic church had approached him a couple of times and he always just said, Nope, sorry, I'm not going to deal with you. Right. Yeah. He actually, um, I think in 1687, it's interesting because his break happens after this happens where he was called to parliament. And we talked about how mm -hmm. when he was in parliament representing Cambridge for a year, the the only thing recorded is him saying something about closing the window right. or opening or whatever. And he was um, in there for more than one session. He was in there for multiple years. Well, or well, I think it was 1690. If I remember it right, he was in there 1691 through like almost to 1700 or something like that. Oh, I'm okay. So he does become he becomes knighted. So, so before he starts sort of his new Isaac Newton towards the end of his life in 1687, he went into parliament for just a year. Oh, I see where he, um, he was supposed to be there work, working against allowing a Roman Catholic to enter Cambridge mm. because at that time, James the second was the monarch. And James II had been openly Catholic, right? So this is after Charles II. Um, there's James II. We talked about this last time in the uh, and the Glorious Revolution, right? Where uh, William comes over from the Netherlands with with Mary, and they become joint monarchs. So before that happens, Isaac Newton was in Parliament fighting against a, um, a Roman Catholic being able to go to Cambridge because James II was trying to be tolerant towards Catholics. So Isaac Newton would have hated that. He was very anti-Catholic. And um, because, as you know, right, he, he just knew his views were right. He just, he had done the math on it, I guess, and he knew that the Trinitarian views could not be correct. And he had his own views, but at the same time, he would have been concerned the whole time of being exposed as mm -hmm. not believing in the Trinity because because that would have been something that was heretical for the Church of England as well. So right. the pressure of him being in that public forum, that's what I imagine, like why he probably couldn't even talk. Because if he had all that rage underneath where he wanted to tell people what he thought, 
But if he's in parliament and he says some, the wrong thing, he knows he could be punished, right? He could have been severely punished for his beliefs. Right, and maybe, he he, lost maybe he wished that he would have went with uh, the Puritans on the Mayflower and uh, went to the New World where they were free to express religion the way they wanted to because of this. I feel like that's what's interesting in 1620 before he's born. That right. already has happened. So the Puritan movement is really strong, but it's mm -hmm. interesting that he is almost like a secret agent where he's a Puritan by going into these areas and trying to maintain um, a false kind of precedent, really, ironically enough, too, to make sure a Roman Catholic doesn't get in there, yet also right. at the same time, uh, the Church of England, they would not be happy to find out that he's in there. Mm -hmm. So... And He's a heretic yeah. trying to get what, especially Church of England has a has for at that time, right? About a hundred and fifty year reign, uh, being like, yeah, Roman Catholics, no, 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 not, not around here. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It reminds me in Caddyshack when when he when the priest is is there and he's like, oh, are you into the, to to the God and my son? And he goes, oh yeah, very much. He goes, oh, are you Roman Catholic? And he and he's just saying yes, just to say yes. He goes, oh well, then you can't come. <laughs> you know, and then she's like, nice job. He's like trying to impress the girl. But it just reminds me of that because it's just like maybe his underlying thing was that the frustration of that he still lives in an area where he needs these places because of his work that he's done to get it out there. And at the same time, I mean, yeah, you're right. I think in 1705, he gets knighted by Queen Anne mm -hmm. that, you know, it's like he's finding his stepping stones to get to that right place and and he's kind of getting all of what he wants except for the things that he really wants which is to be a puritan but he can't but he's getting everything else so it's kind of one of those things where you're getting you're getting all you want but not the one big thing that you really would want but i wonder if he would have was he the type of person who would have wanted to practice his religious belief openly anyway or did he, uh, it seems like being secretive with his ritual practices is what he found spiritual anyway. That's why my big question is who was funding him even through all that? And was well, it yeah. the monarch? It and, had, there and, was, had to be someone because he always stressed out about what's going to happen to me and then nothing did and somebody came in and sort of saved the day. It's like a Hollywood contract. Hmm. Right? Where yeah, it's like who. people are funding, and, and then if you go against them, then there's all the theories like, what will happen to me? Well, maybe there um, was some secret club he went to, and he knew everyone's secrets or something. Or they had secrets on him, like, you know. And that, that that's what makes me question, too, a lot of, you know, like, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, theories, of course, against, his math that it's almost like what's created the idea of this matrix that holds people which is kind of an interesting thing too like is there really gravity right if you were to take it from a matrix point of view in a computer simulation that we're living in or that even the cia has proven that we live in a holographic universe that it takes away the ideas of his math as mm -hmm. being true right. if it's a hologram so what is he an implant is my 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 big question, just as much as I believe that Hitler was an implant. And then it was just in, I think, the last year that the transpondence between the Pope and Hitler was just as him and John Locke, that close. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And when Jews are being killed and the Pope's still talking to you, and they're saying that the Pope was trying to talk him down, hmm. but we haven't seen the letters and uh, there's, with that Pluto in the eighth, Where's the other letters? Maybe those are the smokescreen letters to be like, oh, yeah, it's going well. Well, we will never know. We'll because, never know. Yeah, at the That's end what of I'm his saying. life also, it's funny, when he was on his way out, he knew he was slowing down and dying, and he was in charge of destroying the letters that he wanted destroyed. <laughs> so That's where he put it on the 8th, too. Or, you know, like the Berghoff was destroyed in 45. They destroyed it. Hmm. Right. Or, and then all the scientists take in and right. Like, you know, like the whole Nazi party split into Russia or USSR and America, but got rebranded as American or as a 
is a Soviet scientist now. Right. Like with no bad things. That was Project Paperclip for America, right? Like, okay, Von Braun, you're with us now. Like, who's not to say, like, the, the, the idea that, oh, Hitler went into a bunker with Eva and popped his head off with a gun and that actually even happened. Yeah, we don't know. With Pluto in the eighth, uh, with Gemini, or even the idea that he started to lose his mind, which we're seeing right now with the president, of you know, walking around and losing himself and then, you know, exiting him stage left as, as if, oh, this happened. There's a lot of this question of implant, kind of like what's being implanted or whenever you see Pluto in the eighth and that there's always a lot more to the story than actually there really is, especially in Isaac Newton's case, is, is the, where, where did, was the funding coming from? And, and the fact that he's buried next to monarchs, royalty. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, be, because he... I know he was a knight, but... Yeah, it's like he turned around after his meltdown. He just turned, around, turned it around and he started working the perfect, he got the perfect job for himself. He worked at the Mint and he was in charge of persecuting and uncovering counterfeiters. Just like Benjamin Franklin did in the mm. Revolutionary War. That all the Mint was done to Benjamin Franklin and finding the counterfeit. That's what the British were doing to the mm -hmm. Americans was they were creating counterfeit con, uh, continental money to infl over inflate to make it worth nothing. And mm. Benjamin Franklin purposely spelled continental incorrectly because he knew British would be like, oh, these dumb Americans can't spell correctly. And that was how he started to find which ones were fake. Hmm. So they were similar in that sense. Yeah. And so in England at at this time, um, they were trying to regularize the money, right? That they were trying to make it more or less easy to counterfeit. Not in that way, not, not in such a simple and smart way. It's funny because Benjamin Franklin obviously used strategy or what, I mean, used a little joke, a trick to, to right. make people reveal themselves. A, and a Isaac, trick, a, a, an American trick that the right. British are too proper. <laughs> That they won't well, even the British, allow that they, they yeah, can't they just so they can't within them counterfeit yeah. good enough to to copy that it is incorrect that they have to correct it and counterfeit it <laughs> that that That's the so the, the properness of them would be yeah. their downfall. <laughs> well, and New and Newton was mm. doing the opposite and making sure it was very proper, right? And they were doing all sorts of things like um, money or coins were starting to be mass produced because it was harder to replicate it when it was less, when it was more regular, because before when it was hand stamped, coins could be a little bit off and, or a little mm. bit misshapen and people wouldn't think anything of it. But by this time they're trying to make it more automatic, right? They had their own mechanized ways to create the money and they put the little ridges on the side and mm -hmm. did things that would be harder to replicate. And so Newton was, um, you know, part of that whole system of trying to make sure it wasn't easy to replicate. He also uh, hunted down um, notorious counterfeiters and... Like literally like walked around like, I'm coming to get to you. Yeah, he s turned his obsessive uh, gaze onto punishing counterfeiters. So wow. imagine what that was like, being a counterfeiter in Newton's era and he's doing the calculus of your money <laughs> and showing up at your house and yeah knocking and he, on the door and all looking the all uranus -y <laughs> and his hair and uh, what isaac newton and uh, you're kind of it yeah I mean, I mean and if he equated it with godliness too or something you don't have the window closed <laughs> That's what I'm saying is that like he would not have been a very uh, easy guy to be getting along with. Yeah, but we need more people like that. You know, I think that's what we why we started thinking about Isaac Newton was right. we need people 
who aren't afraid to think outside of what society's saying, here is what you need to believe, right? And to not um, back down even when you think society is going to be there policing you, right? right? He's proof that you could still continue to have your own weird beliefs and do all your weird practices. And I guess because of his astrology, people would come in and assist him at the right times or... Um, well, my question to that is, why was he knighted? Because if he was... If my theory is that he's funded by the church, or I mean, sorry, not the church, by the monarch, like, what was there... Especially that was a a monarch that was installed that moved to Queen Anne, mm -hmm. right? Like... Was he installed from an installed monarch? I don't know. I was looking because, at like, the... did they knight him because of his minting? Like, that's kind of a weak well, I way to be because, minted. Yeah, it's because of the Principia that he. Okay, so from you know, that, yeah, his from famous his work, scientific yeah, yeah, work, and this was an era of you know England being proud to be like the most advanced scientific nation in the world and their empire is starting to grow. Um, He's kind of like the know. Elon Musk at the time and the president awarding Elon Musk with something or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, and, or Elon Musk it's was like, I mean, time person of the year right. last year. So, so, so imagine, or imagine being the first person ever. No, don't imagine that being the first person ever but who was the, uh, person of the year for time because wasn't that Hitler or no am I wrong no no, no he just no. was one he just was okay. one but imagine being the first one who ever reached that pinnacle right so Isaac Newton was the first one of the first celebrities in England and not to mention a first scientific celebrity because, who wasn't a monarch yeah because he was so uniquely I think Isaac Newton couldn't have come out of anywhere but Britain and he wasn't at that Scottish time. Like, you know. Who or why? <laughs> Who are you thinking? Well, I don't know. I was just thinking of like, well, you know, James. William Wallace. <laughs> William Wallace was famous, but he right. was Scottish well, there, yeah, and he was against the English. Yeah, there were a lot of famous right? people, but this was the beginning of an era of celebrity where people might have been like, Isaac Newton lives there. Let's go try to knock on his door and see him or let's wait and see Isaac he Newton He would have been like by. Mr. Burns. Get off my garden. <laughs> Release the hounds. Well, by then, don't you think he would have enjoyed it, though? It was at the end of his life where he was really famous. so, And he, he did enjoy it. He enjoyed suddenly, like, dressing yeah, up in nicer I think, wigs I think, and all I that. think once he was knighted, looking at his astrology and his progressed son, when it reached Jupiter in his fifth and Pisces, he lived his latter part of his life, I would say, in a much more enjoyable place. And I think that he probably, it was a nice rest for his mind, too, to just kind of focus on more... Like, mm, let me see some counterfeiting or, oh, look, and I'm kind of like a celebrity. I'm a Capricorn liking mm. attention for being of something. A Capricorn feels secure in their life once they've reached a benchmark they've tried to reach. And for him to be knighted and to reach worldwide fame that would leave something that's everlasting, that we're talking about him right now. Right. That's a pretty secure spot for a Capricorn. Like, of, oh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Here we go. Hmm. Hmm. And so being able to not express his Puritan ways fully was the sacrifice that he made. Hmm. But that's always like the big question of a true Puritan, especially as a family that is part of the Quaker movement and the original Quaker movement, right? Like that's not a real Puritan if you're still sacrificing something in gain for notoriety or something like that. Hmm. Yeah. He definitely would not be in the house of friends. No, he wouldn't be. I think he was enjoying that he finally found a way to fit in amongst the Church of England people, right? Um, and being praised for, for applying his crazy mind or his calculating mind to something that was useful for the country in terms of the money, right? Right. And regulating the economy. I guess I'm looking you know, at it from a a Puritan view in the new world, like yeah. what they would have thought been like. Oh no, he was ab the absolute opposite. By exactly then. right. That I'm saying that they would just be like, oh, what a, what, like how I look at people at who 
over the last two years of the pandemic, celebrities who touted whatever the government wanted and got paid for it. It's like, ah, you're one of them. He might have been touting what the government wanted, right? I mean, as you're kind of suggesting. That's um, what I'm suggesting that, is that so, the fu he's a funded, yeah, based off in the same way that Hitler was too, right? Like there, there was... I mean, like, you know, Hitler's life going through World War One, and then, you know, having a distrust for, you know, the old guard of, of the old German, you know, Reich of, of in, the, in the Prussian kind of stuff that was going on and writing about that and do, trying to get an insurrection and then all them bailing out on him. Obviously, somebody saw that and funded him. And after the fall of the, the you know, the big superinflation of the 20s and so forth, right? Like, you know, there obviously was some sort of funding to rise the Socialist Party, the Nazi Party behind Hitler that definitely touted him and he's shaking hands with the Pope. And But that's what's interesting is Hitler does go with, with, the, with the Catholic Church, right? Mm -hmm. where, where Isaac Newton doesn't, but goes with the Church of England and the monarch, so... I don't know. Well, I mean, Hitler would have been raised, wasn't he? Was he raised a Catholic? I would assume, since he's from Austria, the Catholic yeah. Church would have been really big there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, he was finally accepted, I guess, by his right by that church. But um, it's interesting that I found something that says it was for history on this day, April fifteenth, seventeen o five. It says after a lifetime of, of achievement, Queen Anne knighted Isaac Newton while visiting Cambridge. The lavish ceremony took place at his beloved Trinity College, hopefully not in the shed. Some have suggested the knighthood was motivated by politics and the 1705 election, not because of his scientific work. So, and he was knighted with Sir Francis Bacon. Mm-hmm. The only other scientist to be knighted in Great Britain. Right, which, to be honest, I'm much more of a Sir Francis Bacon mm -hmm. team than Isaac Newton team. But... Again, the politics, I mean, if you just think about how Joe Biden uh, this week pardoned all marijuana, you know, possessions, um, right? Mm -hmm. It's political, it's not, right? So it's right. like, or, you know, uh, Sir Elton John, right? Who's already been knighted as a musician, right? For his work through AIDS, just got our highest award just two weeks ago from the I president. Oh yeah, and what was sir, the award? Is it the it's Kennedy? The, no, Honor the national. Um, well, I guess we're on a show with the historian. I got to get exactly correct. <laughs> um, Elton John uh, Biden Award. He got awarded, um, and he was moved to tears by the surprise award. Um, Oh, with the National Humanities Medal, hmm. which, you know, that's it right there. And there they are. It's obviously political. Interesting. I mean, so... And they had him play right there in front of the White House, at the White House. What did he and play? And his song about, you know, like, because of what's going on with, you know, abortion or what's going on with gay rights or what's going on with all that and the AIDS work too and the money that Biden committed back to AIDS, right? It's, it's, it's one of those kind of political moves about like not even, well, where's all the money for all the people with long COVID or where's all the money for the people with adverse effects to what's been just, that was a big story in the last day that the government has all the data and it's 4.2 million people had severe adverse effects that they went to doctors for and all that stuff that they never told anybody 4.2 million hmm. right and then you're just showing let's go back to aids <laughs> you know like what about now this is this is bigger than aids now mm -hmm. you know and wow. so it's a very uh that's what i'm saying is like his chart has there was a there was funding it, the same way if you think of the way our government works today right like the government funds certain people to do research just like F dr anthony fauci is part of the nih and the and nasd right like all that stuff 
N A A N A N A I S D, right? And all that stuff. And he then allocates the funds of what research to go and stuff. It's almost like, here's the money, do the research to make you a celebrity and to make us the scientific, you know. And then you have Sir Francis Bacon, who's, I would say, similar, but way more into the esoteric and way more into, I guess you could say, the art of it than kind of the mathematical aspect of it. There's like a much more spiritual, esoteric version of Sir Francis Bacon mm -hmm. and much more deeper connection with alchemy than Isaac Newton. It's interesting because um, Francis Bacon was from an, a more elite background. And so here's what was different about Isaac Newton is that he came from that farmer's family or that yeoman mm -hmm. family. And that he was able to work his way up into the system. Um, Francis Bacon would have, so it was more common for people like Francis Bacon or Robert Boyle to be pursuing science because they came, they were more gentlemen, right? They had an, an income that would allow them to take time out to do science. Whereas Isaac Newton always would have needed somebody to help him because he didn't come from an aristocratic or gentleman's family. So it was different for him to do, to do science. I mean, I don't, that's just one thing. I well, I'm of. thinking of like, I have a book published in 1712. It's the, it's in French. Of course, it's the apologies of people who did magic. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's like interesting that seven years later, that book's published about Nostradamus to anybody who was practicing magic or alchemy or stuff and the deep apologies to how the churches reacted to them. Mm hmm. It almost kind of feels like they're using the knighthood of these scientists that are using the things that have been demonized before them right? as a way to be like, oh, it's okay, and let's forget about our, our inquisitions and all of our, you know <laughs> well, what I mean? Like, it was definitely diverting attention in England or in Britain. It would have been there were there mm -hmm. this was the age of parties where there was party conflict between Whigs and Tories there and he was, was also, a Whig yeah but there um, there was and and you know that did mon some monarchs also supported the Whig party right right and so they weren't always all Tories but um so he could have been a, an influential Whig supported by a monarch as mm -hmm. well um yeah because it but, wasn't like they were going to make him prime minister no so he could have been like a secret prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It would be interesting if he was. Like if, if uh, the queen had her John D, but it was Isaac Newton. If, if I were to give you the reason why I think there's a lot of things that need to be investigated on him on the real deeper connections is he's... Now, a lot of us today, if you were born in the last 50 to 70 years, you don't have Pluto in opposition to Neptune. He was born with Pluto opposed Neptune. So, and, and, and he has his Pluto in the eighth house. And, and to me, that, that, that already is screaming of what, what's really hidden. Both of those planets are outer planets and both of them deal with secrets and hidden elements. And so, and then they're also in the houses of finance and money. So there is mm -hmm. definitely, um, you know, and they're, and they're also in the signs of Gemini and Sag, which deal with, you know, the collective understanding of written words, stories, books, you know, literature, you know, and what is published. And so it's like what funding was published. To, to, it's like who was publishing him, right? Like th that's the other thing is like, especially because books back in the day when they were published used to have the seal of the monarch on them. Right. You get the official so does that on. does that mean that his book of print what is Principia? it a print mm -hmm. it is sealed with like queen anne or no back then i think it was um uh, uh it's the gosh, the orange it, what's his name so it was william and mary william mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, or so i'm wondering was, if that royal no, seals was, on that publication um well everything but see everything published at this time would have had to have like the, the stationer's approval. So everything being printed above the board in England at least has a seal, would have it. So his would have it mm -hmm. then. But it was also printed with the assistance of 
Edmund Haley, who was a big wig astronomer and in the Royal Society and has the connections, and he was a more elite person than Newton. So it is true that he always would have had to have support of the people who were actually connected in society. So whether or not it's always the monarch, it's definitely, um, you know, but by the, see, actually by the time he's knighted, he probably got really used to always having some elite person who was advocating for him. And so he probably loved now. Okay. Now I'm going to be Queen Anne's toy and he's, she's going to knight me. Right. That's what makes, makes me really think about the works in history up until really you have an American revolution and and the freedom of true press, right? And the freedom of free speech and Thomas Paine Mm -hmm. who writes common sense or writes the crisis, the American crisis, which gets the Americans through the war, right? Is the first publication that that's not stamped by a monarch. It's in colonies that are still technically from the monarch. Mm-hmm. and is putting that those pamphlets out and people are following it right and so whether it's the work of newton or anything prior to that it's it's like there's there's queenie or there's a king or there's somebody going making sure like your life is dead if that if a book or a pamphlet comes out that goes against the way this thing works mm-hmm you have me thinking about this. I, you know, I'm thinking about it in the back of my mind because I know from my own work, from, from my research, that Mary, so William and Mary, Mary II, and Anne were both really big into reforming manners, like making people more moral in public, right? Mm. And trying to get out of this era that had been really immoral. So if you were somebody... Oh, who, from chopping heads off of... Charles II. Well, you, you can chop the heads off, but you know, if you're acting immoral and you're a common person, that was a problem. Um, so this was an era where there were also threats from Jacobites, from Catholic monarchs that were trying to come back. Right, every so often there'd be a Jacobite rebellion or mm. people trying to raise arms and overthrow the monarch. Um, but Newton, being that he was so upstanding and he had appropriately squelched his desires right he had his little meltdown about the guy that he was infatuated with but then he stopped all that sexual feeling the thing is that it this was an era and i don't know if this could be pluto opposed neptune as an era but it was an era that was very like uh dichotomous like on one hand you have like the quakers emerging and very puritanical groups like and like Oliver Cromwell and the Commonwealth they were extremely protestant minded puritan people right but then you had on the opposite side like Charles II and many others who were all into the debauchery and who were i mean the guy actually one of the guys that Newton um pers- prosecuted for being a counterfeiter do you know what else he create? He made what? Um, a pocket watch, a fake pocket watch with a dildo in it. <laughs> that was another of his objects. So it was a time where we think of the ba- the past as very prudish because we think of like the 19th century Victorian era. But this was a time that was pretty wild. There was a lot of por- pornography. There was it, um, that was a new invention at this time. Like you've got the press and you can print all kinds of pornography and pubs really and are coffee a new houses thing too are right. like you could go to a coffee house that had your political persuasion or it could even be a less reputable one uh, there were tons of brothels also it was a very immoral for for somebody who believes in a traditional sense of a mor- of morality it was an extremely immoral time so it was like biden's america so that makes sense was it <laughs> But there, well, no, I'm just saying, like, you know, we're seeing just crime out of nowhere right now. Oh, we're seeing, crime was, yeah. Crime right, we're seeing, we're seeing just a lot of things that are very immoral happening, mm-hmm. snatching grabs to people just, you know, not caring right. anymore. Because it was like a transitional time of 
old systems had broken down. Right. And really the new systems weren't put in place. Like this is the 1690s or actually the 1800s is when the police force was finally created in London. So mm. there was... And that's you know, right when the new monarch was installed. Right. The installed ones. The installed ones meaning people who were chosen by chosen by parliament or by no the one th 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 that was that Jupiter Neptune mm. conjunction remember that we looked at in 1690 with of Orange right. what's his name yeah. and William of Orange okay William yes. of Orange yeah. and how they did propaganda over the monarch that was supposed to mm -hmm. take over yeah and saying that they had a bastard child and that was a bad moral thing mm -hmm. and then they made a deal with William of Orange that if he comes and becomes the monarch, you got to make sure that the people have their parliament the right way. And there was some deals done. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> Are there similarities between that time and now? Or in that time, yes. In the 1690s to now. Yeah. What is similar? The it's propaganda. The, it's the Jupiter, Neptune and Pisces. Jupiter, Neptune yeah. and Pisces. Same way that we had it in 1856 and uh, the, propaganda that brought on the civil war and also that was trying to say that you know the Whig party which turned into the republican party was weak because they don't like freedom because of trying to abolish slavery mm -hmm. right and that free states were really not free because they are at a rule hmm. right but how people are fighting today for to be able to have their autonomy of their health whether it's from you know medical aspects from all spectrums to abortion to what they ingest in their bodies and having the centralized government saying no right and all of those things kind of come out like um like a religious discourse today right like right. if you make certain medical decisions today you're identifying your your politics and your i i mean your dogma right? Your belief systems based on what choices you're making medically. Um, because I was thinking at this time in the 1690s, it was, um, you could apply your religious principles to also trying to micromanage society and to make it conform to your belief system. Because mm. of what I was thinking is, you know how um, Newton wrote the whole list of all of his sins and right. all of that. He actually did that again in the seven, I think actually right after he had his breakdown, mm -hmm. so in the 1690s, he did another kind of accounting of his sins. But by the 1690s, early 1700s, Puritans started form, or not, I wouldn't, I shouldn't say Puritans, Puritan minded and more morally driven um, people formed these committees that were all about going around and taking it upon themselves to police each other or to police people. They weren't police, right? But they, so re, it reminds me of social media, like... Um, Fact-checking. Yeah. But so they were taking their doctrine and their mm -hmm. religious belief and going out and applying it to the society that they lived mm. in to try to make it conform to what they thought was correct. But of course, they also all were kind of hip, hypocritically right. like, going to the brothels and all that themselves. But they were also policing, mm. policing the city. And stuff. So, I don't, I just made that comparison. Of, yeah. It seems kind of similar to. Well, more police today. officers have quit, and nobody is joining the police force anymore. And then they are hmm. policing more in the areas of social media now than in real right. life, which is kind of weird. Through, this is true or this is false, and and, just and, and going back to your question of Pluto opposed Neptune in sixteen forty three and the buildup and that was the civil war time in england 42 43 that pluto and neptune opposition is weird because it's like this absolute um need for this idea that's in conflict to this wide open belief system without boundaries in which one is the right one or which one is the factual one in the battles and the obsession with not changing positions of spiritual morality based on what is, and, 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 and again, throwing fact around spiritual energy, like, no, Jesus is the one. And if you don't practice Jesus by this, this, this way, then 
you don't go there. And no, no, no. If you don't do that, then you'll go to purgatory. And then you'll do, you know, like, and mm -hmm. if you don't see a bishop, and if you don't take it from the Catholics and the Catholic Church, no, no, no. If you're not Puritan, like, you know, like, it, it's extreme, chaotic, intense, passionate battles. And also, um, it's mutable, so it's changing constantly. So it's almost like a time where one minute it's that. But, well, now we just, yeah, no, that's the new fact. You know, wait, what? Like, you know, it's just a kind of like a extreme, separa extreme separation based upon beliefs which really are not known. Mm -hmm. Like there's no fact. Right. And everybody's looking for the facts, but you're seeing more of the illusion of the belief. That's the complex. Whereas like people like in our time that are born, we have it in a nice sextile. So we actually don't really question what feels like destiny in ourselves. We don't have a conflict of it. So even Sir Isaac Newton would have conflict but with that in his chart of like what, what's the spiritual way and what's the way mm -hmm. to commit to. He battled that his whole life and all the people at that time are battling that. But it's funny because it is like it was, so then it was a time where that idea of needing chaos to purify and become good, like it makes sense why alchemy would appeal to those people then, right? Because there's this idea, when I, when I did my basic reading of, of, of alchemy, it talked about mercury being the first metal, right? Like the first, the most um, pure, wonderful, what, I don't even know, like the best metal, because it could be liquid at room temperature. And everything else had to be warmed up to right. turn into liquid. And so there was this thought that mercury was the one that was the solution, I guess. Or, you well, know. it's the hermeticism that comes through alchemy of mercury and Hermes, mm -hmm. right? And the understanding of that there's a neutral, right? So it's a neutral. It doesn't need to be heated up. It doesn't need to be, mm -hmm. it could be in its natural state, but it really is not one side or the other. It's understanding it's through mercury and being able to do that, that you could see this side and you could see this side, what needs to be cooled, what needs to be heated. Because mm -hmm. if so that's the central point, right? That's the whole thing of mercury. It's the point, right? So if like you have something that you can find a point with, then you can observe other sides of things. Mm -hmm. That's why we can understand a masculine and a feminine mm -hmm. through a human body, which would be the mercurial, mercurial understanding of a point. Is it a woman or is it a man, right? So hermeticism goes into the understanding of the div divinity and understanding both sides of things and how they come together. And if they don't come together, mm -hmm. then it's not true mm -hmm. divinely. And so, it's the first yeah. planet closest to the sun. And in, especially in Greece and Roman mythology, Mercury Hermes is the messenger of the gods. Mm -hmm. So it delivers the message of the gods, which would make sense, right? In alchemy, if you don't need to heat something up, you don't need to, it already is in its state. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea of something that naturally already is. You don't need to alter it. You don't need to do something to it. But, and doesn't that seem like it would be such a Pluto Gemini thing to, to kind of idealize Mercury itself to right. think that is the most sacred uh, uh, metal or the purest one because it's neither one or the other. It's in Correct. that middle. And so that's what's so interesting to me then that today, why now are we so obsessed with trying to define things as like for us? The, well, we've been in the opposite. Know? Pluto Sag, and now we just oh. are finishing Pluto Capricorn. Hmm. So it's not so much the point. It's much more of trying to have who knows more. I'm so tired of that. Right? Like who knows more? Mm -hmm. Who's morally the guru? Who is the ultimate teacher? Who's been through the experience better than others? Who's had more? Who has more? But in Capricorn, it's who has the right authority? Who is the one that knows better through authority and knowing how to make decisions that are correct and others that don't have the capacity to? Hmm. Right. So there's the, the power trip of we understand what to do. You don't. So we're very uncomfortable with the idea of chaos. Well, this I has think. been the obsession with order. Right. Yeah. 
and then the and then the the idea that of, of the chaos is how much order has taken over our world. That there that the order is afraid to they don't trust Pluto chaos. They don't trust that people will be able to be alive without a shot. They don't believe that people can express their ideas without it being a conspiracy theory constantly. Mm -hmm. That the idea that a theory is a theory is okay with freedom of speech. There's no, it doesn't yeah. matter if it's a conspiracy theory or a theory, it's a theory. Oh, and think about the concepts of freedom of speech, the concepts of, of the scientific method. Right. That's they all, all come happening from, with Pluto Gemini. Right? I mean, it was a conspiracy theory for Galileo to say that the earth revolved around the sun and got thrown into a prison. Right. So, but that's right. And then he was right. So that's been yeah. the whole funny thing about meme culture is how many conspiracy theories, it, it's not so much one person, but the collective has been feeling like, ah, I don't know if I'd trust that one. And then it comes to pass that we were all right. And then watching the centralized governments and the centralized powers of the world not take true character and own responsibility, which is what Capricorn is. So it's the throwing away of responsibility yet power tripping over you being responsible yet not taking any responsibility for oneself. Whereas back then it would have been, no, this is the word of God and this is how to be and this is the point to be yet my brothel visit was amazing last night, you know, <laughs> right? So right. It, it, it's still a responsibility thing because Pluto at the end of the day is um, about <coughs> whether your commitments truly stand if you are trustworthy or not, hmm. right? But in Capricorn, it's, it's exalted because it's like true commitment and true trust comes with responsibility. Hmm. So we're seeing it at the, and, and the last time it would have been was in 15, 17 and 18 with Saturn, which was, of course, against the churches, right? Like, mm -hmm. what? And then in 1284, again, with the churches. This is what's weird is the blending of science being the new religion. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. we can thank Isaac Newton for giving them their hops <laughs> and extreme happiness for which looks like, in my opinion, that he was installed for this. Mm -hmm. Because one day, as evolution happens, his theories and his every, everything in science is meant to change. It's, mm -hmm. and there's no absolute. But, you know, if he was alive today, exactly like he was, he would have been on to something new. Yeah, I think of Einstein and his and his, and, and his understanding of relativity and time travel and all these other things, mm -hmm. right? That he was going into there, yet we haven't seen if those theories come true yet, right? Mm -hmm. And we also don't know the facts on some of the space stuff, what's really going on when you're seeing UFOs that they're admitting in the government today doing what would go against Isaac Newton's gravity theories, right? Or... Ua, Ua Mua, which a Harvard professor came out and said that this thing is not just natural and that it actually probably is from alien, meaning it's just an unidentified, unknown conscious place that it propelled against the sun and went against the gravitational pull of the sun. So that discredits Isaac Newton's theories. Right. And we're seeing, a gov we're seeing this all come out. So that's why it's an interesting thing of the the science changes and it nothing's does, absolute yeah. in science. And I think that's the thing that in Isaac Newton's era, they, I guess the scientific method and exploration was so new and they were exploring the natural world in part for the divinity that it revealed. And they had many different reasons for looking at it. And I think that they would have never thought they were discovering absolutes. They weren't. They didn't think they were discovering the only the only truth. I mean, actually, even Isaac Newton's own concept of gravity was never absolute. Yeah, and it was he knew himself that he it was God in the world in the picture that he saw. Right, not right. not some truth that was divorced from the rest of the system. 
And that's what's so weird that, that it's they divorced it. Yeah, they wouldn't have recognized what what we're what we're being told as science today. That's n they wouldn't see that as science. They would have seen it as dogma, right? Because well, they would yeah. have never thought it shouldn't change. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, and I think if you think of Queen Anne knighting him, and she's trying to bring back order and you know a nicer commonwealth that is much more moral. Mm -hmm. It's settling the debates over people, which were the same debates that were happening in, you know, the 1500s during the last Saturn Pluto, right? That were about, you know, whether or not the Holy Roman Church is really the place of the only place to get to God, right? Whereas this was a battle of what's, is Earth the center of our universe or is the sun or, you know, and in, in, in using him to be the nail in the coffin, like, this is the way it is, everybody. He proved it. Right. Move on. Let's build the tomb. Let's build, yeah, let's move on. And we'll and put him it. in with us royals that he's so glorified that he is so good enough to lay with the royals. Because look at the way the people reacted to Queen Elizabeth II's death. If right now they were to take, Elton John. definitely not Meghan Markle, but if they were to take Elton John and say, Sir Elton John died today, right? Oh, and then, oh, he was so glorious. And if he had a last standing word about how the words of my song, your song, right? <laughs> are the, are the, the way to live your life. And that's the way it is. Everybody, that's the way it is. He's being laid next to Queen Elizabeth II. <laughs> People in England would be like, oh my God, okay. <laughs> but I think they would put him near Princess Diana. Oh, well, get, get, if they did that, that, then even more so, then you get the people who have the doubts and you still get the people who have the love right? of the monarch. You get them both. Yep. <laughs> so to me, like, we don't do that in America, right? Like, Buffalo Bill was a huge, amazing, he had given the Medal of Honor. They took it away from him after his death because of his stories of the Wild West. And mm -hmm. there was a lot of Indian wars and they wanted to not have anybody. And they redid the Medal of Honor based upon Buffalo Bill because they were like, yeah, we want to make it a different way. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they'll, they'll take away in America somebody's. They'll strip them away after they're dead. Right? And I always think about that about Buffalo Bill, you know, like, he reached a great benchmark in his life and he went around and was doing a tour about his book and everything. And then he had medal of honor and he had been, he's the one who told the stories of, of Boone and of course of Davy Crockett and all these stories, the Alamo, all this stuff that happened. And then, nah, you know, we don't like that wild West shit. Pull that fucking, you know, from him. And we don't lay him to rest next to a president. Right. We don't lay anybody with the Medal of Honor next to a president. We have veterans who you go to those cemeteries. We do have the Arlington Cemetery, which would be probably the highest place to get buried in America. Well, I guess in J is it is JFK Jr. buried? I mean, JFK buried there. Well, it's got the yeah, because the, Arl the Arlington Cemetery is where the president and the vice president take the wreath and they mm -hmm. touch it together. Which the only president and vice president in history since we've been doing this to not touch the wreath and pull it to their chest and then put it back on is Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Or to have a four gun salute, they got a three gun salute, which is one of a foreign entity has entered into the cemetery with a dud and then a, a six second where the four gun salute for every other president has been bang, bang. And they do it right at the inauguration, not after it and when they're arriving at the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest question of, I think, these times or even in, if you think of the burial of Isaac Newton, like, what, are they going to bury Biden in the Arlington Cemetery and put up a huge, like, you know, build back better flag and say... Everybody follow this, like, you know, he's, he's buried in the Arlington Cemetery, you know. I don't know. That's the, the, like, it's weird how that the death and the, to me, like, it's the work of him and his interests and so forth go along with so much of what I like.
but there's a lot of questions in his chart of is he was he really or, or it kind of reminds me of the Shakespeare conspiracy of was Shakespeare really a person and and and, and, and was this the work of a bunch of people that put it all through his work it kind of reminds me of like who was the one feeding him the work that wanted to publish him out to not have them be the ones to get an idea or something across and also to create a, a science community that would be England being at the top where I feel like Sir Francis Bacon was the way of bringing in somebody who, you know, if you think of the left and the right, it would like have Trump be knighted and have Biden be knighted. Like, dude, you get both sides of it. Like at the same time for political reasons, like mm. they state Psh. because Sir Francis Bacon people like me are definitely not Sir Isaac Newton people mm -hmm. of study, right? Well, I think people should be both. That's the whole point, right? <laughs> that, it, that, that you get people into the center and then they follow in line. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's interesting. And that's what Biden said on his inauguration speech. And people are saying, well, you're not being very, you know, together, but what you see with Ukraine or what you see with you know, Ar Armageddon of nuclear war will bring people to center and follow whatever it is to come back together through <laughs> World War III or whatever. And, th and that's what happens. Mm -hmm. And it was a Democratic president that was during World War II. And just the evening before of Pearl Harbor, the, the general of the, or sorry, the admiral of the Navy made a big speech in Washington, how we're so safe and there's no problems and everything's fine. And then the next morning Pearl Harbor happens and uh, army was in charge of a Navy base and locked all the planes down and had the key and it was on a Sunday and he was out <coughs> the night before drinking and so nobody could access the planes and they all got bombed and it just so happened that the the carriers that we had were on a debt to go do training so all of our battleships got hit but not our aircraft carriers that needed to go <coughs> to fight the Japanese so anyway sorry Brian <coughs> I have a cough now. I don't know why I'm being interfered with. Something's well, I think it was. I think it was a great talk, and I feel that. Um, I I feel personally. I feel like. I want to do more investigation into him now. I don't know how much there is left to do, but. I feel like if you were to circle his entourage. And go down his entourage that you would find more links to the way things were being done especially the fact that he was born during a civil war and he was the one during a reconstruction put up at such a high esteem to get people of alchemy of religion and science to all celebrate and wonder over a man well, and, you know, I had a different view coming into this about him. And then looking at his chart and looking at his progressions and then hearing some of the stories and then looking at the way the world is now and looking at the way that we're seeing these figures or even the fact that Kanye West came out and the stuff that he said on Tucker Carlson, it really starts to make you wonder, even though I don't think it's a wonder for a lot of us, but it makes you really, for maybe those that have never wondered, like, how much really is installed and in, you know like when he's talking about the phone calls that the kardashians are getting from the clintons and right. to promote the shot and all these kind of things right and that he's willing to say it or that he's blacklisted from hollywood and they talk crap on him and because he liked trump and that he even got persuaded to say that he didn't like trump and then he finally rescinded that and said that was because of what they were telling me to do like it's pretty deep right <clears throat> i think um it's really interesting that isaac knew i mean I, okay i'm thinking about your theory i have to think a little bit more about it but what's really interesting if you read the principium i was just thinking of it as an example of <clears throat> okay this is a time when science wasn't disconnected from god <clears throat> because there's a whole the whole third book brings up the concept of God a lot, right? That this is, these laws are being discovered because it's God's natural law. And 
you but you can look at it on one hand of him bringing all those disc all those ideas together like you said science and religion all come together in this one treatise and whether it was a you know just as an accident newton happened to write that and then all of the monarchs say this is perfect because well, it has we to be done through the Church of it. England. If it was done in with the Puritans over in Plymouth, I would totally be down. But the fact that it's still through a centralized monarch, which is in control of the church, mm -hmm. and he has to act a certain <clears throat> way to not... So he doesn't even believe in the actual Trinity. And he has to not just act, but, you know... What does he do if he gets asked about the Trinity? Oh, how's the Trinity? How you love the Trinity, right? Mm -hmm. He's probably just like... <laughs> well, no, it right? reminds so, me of... So, um, so to <clears throat> me, it's like if he's already falsifying his idea of God to people of God in mm -hmm. a church that is stamping the approval of him in the work, is it really about bringing God in if he can't follow it in himself? Right. I mean, and that's, that's the problem that we have today, right? That's the problem we have today, yeah. When and you have doctors saying and making a Hippocratic Oath, which goes back to Hippocrates and goes back to Greece and goes back to the oldest of, of medicine and right. having a responsibility for patient and, and consent and so forth, um, in the hundreds of thousands of them not following it or, or telling them, Oh, yeah, it's safe and effective and all these kind of things and just saying to get it. And I won't treat you unless you come in here with that. You know, like, it reminds me of Isaac Newton. Like, oh, I'm talking about God, but I'm going to lie to other people that I don't really, you know? Well, and it was like, hey, you can have this nice wig and this nice outfit and you can live here and you can have this title and we're going to build this great tomb for you when you're gone. Because I think it was being designed even before he was gone. So <clears throat> he he kind of sold honestly out to, the, for the, the, the the MNRA <laughs> technology would would not be here if it wasn't for the implant of Sir Isaac Newton. Well, that's probably true. Yeah. In I the mean, way that it's like take down it's like this is for sure and let's move on and let's move into just science now because after him it's just science. Well, and people try to remember him. By the time you get to the 19th century, or today, if you read a textbook, it's going to remember him as the first modern scientist, not right. the That's last sorcerer, like this book says. Right. right. So. Yeah, the false sorcerer who can't own it in the church. Well, and wouldn't he have really been, he would have been aware of that too. And he probably, if he was truly trying to transmute his soul or whatever it was through the alchemy by the end of his life wouldn't he have known he didn't ever quite make it right no, because yeah. he still was holding in his beliefs unless he suddenly had this epiphany that the trinity was the right way but i seriously doubt it no i think on his tomb it would say the beginning of the deep state <laughs> do you want to know what the beginning of the swamp i'm looking at the at the there's so much. There is a whole um, poem written. Oh, on let's, this see. Thing, so let's see. I'd love to see. Let's see. If it says by the that. way, this is all live. Like, Ann and I have not talked about any of this. That remote has turned off. What remote? There's lost connection. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So just reconnect. So do you want to. Um, <clears throat> or she could take my Mac Mini. Don't worry. Or you could. Yeah, just go to Mac Mini. Um, just go to Mac Mini. A poem sacred to the memory of Sir Isaac Newton. You just have to connect your computer to Mac Mini. That's, I don't think that's the one. It'll say Mac Mini with like a little Apple TV logo. The Mac Mini, the, okay. It just says, yeah, the Mac Mini, I think. Okay. <clears throat> that work? It's not up yet. No. Oh, we're up. Oh, that's the wrong thing, but, um. 
Yeah, I'd love to see this. If it has any connection to deep state. <laughs> well, here's his actual tomb. I'm wondering if it has its uh, has the poem on here. I'm wondering, is it, is it a picture of him, or uh, I mean, uh, uh, like, is it a? This is the tomb right Can here. Can we zoom in on that? The picture. This is of the it? drawing, I think. Yeah, I'd love to just zoom in on this thing. <clears throat> what do they have at the top? They have a star. That one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pointed star. Okay. They have it on an ob an obelisk, uh, like in what we see in Washington and what we see in e Egypt. Wait, let's see the real one. Here's the actual freeze from the. They gave him angels, or are those his little Cherubs? child servants <laughs> doing calculus. <laughs> I think they are. In heaven, he's got some. And putting things in the fire and brimstone. Mm. Oh, wow. They actually are. Somebody is. They're burning all of his letters for him. Or they're kindling his furnace for his alchemical experiments. And here's his telescope. It's a little trippy that they got little kids. Well, they <sighs> cherub, cherubs are always on these things. And this, that's the actual moment. Oh, but the sun. Is that what that is? I'm assuming mm. if he's the one who, it was about the work that he did with the sun, giving it the gravity and the understanding of the mass of the sun and why the earth would rotate around the sun and gravity. Oh, I can't zoom in on the bottom. Let's see if it has the... Okay, here's the translation then. Here is buried Isaac Newton Knight, who by a strength of mind almost divine and mathematical principles, peculi peculiar peculiarly his own, explored the course and figures of the planets, the paths of comets, the tides of the sea, the dissimilarities in rays of light, and what no other scholar has previously imagined, the properties of the colors thus produced. We forgot, to, I mean, talked about his optics experiments. Diligent, sagacious, and faithful. In his expositions of nature, antiquity, and the holy scriptures, he vindicated by his philosophy the majesty of God, mighty, and good, and expressed the simplicity of the gospel in his manners. Mortals rejoice that there has existed such a great an ornament of the human race, he was born on the 25th of December, 1642, and died on the 20th of March, 1726. Mm. Oh, and then the epitaph for Newton that wasn't put said, Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God saith, say it, said, let Newton be, and all was light. They weren't allowed to put that on the monument, though, so that was too much for the Church of England, I guess. He explored the course and figures of the planets, the paths of comets, the tides of the sea, the dissimilarities in rays of light, and who, or what no other scholar had previously imagined, the properties of the colors with the prism thus produced. antiquity and the holy scriptures he vindicate he vindicated by his philosophy the majesty of god mighty and good of the church of england not his true because if it was from the mighty and good and expressed the simplicity of the gospels in his manners of uh, of the gospel in his manners that would mean that he does agree with the trinity from their perspective am i correct Mm. If well, the Gospels that, that are speaking of the Trinity of that time, and that's what the church at that time was about, that he is of good manners of that Gospel. I think that they're just literally meaning more, because, I mean, I know at this time manners really meant 
behaviors or politeness. Um, so he expressed the simplicity of the gospel in his manners. I think they mean because he was so reserved and well-mannered that that was expressing the gospel. So I think by, influ by uh, focusing on that, they avoid the idea of the Trinity. I guess that's why they maybe say vindicated by his philosophy, the majesty of God, mighty and good. Because it says his expositions of nature, antiquity, and the holy scriptures. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So he v vindicated the he vindicated the holy scriptures um, by his philosophy. So they're saying that he supported and up upheld the Bible. By yeah, and I'm science. wondering who the woman is at the top of, I guess that's the sun, or is that Jupiter? I mean, it has to be the sun. I don't know. I always think of, the, do you mean this woman here yeah. on top? I saw somebody had put in the chat, maybe Venus, um, but I'm thinking it's some sort of muse. I don't, let me see. I used to know all this. Um, does I mean, I hate to say, it's are? very Masonic. Well, yeah, I, I was thinking at first this little cherub over here at the furnace was building a wall, but it's actually... And the skull and bones, which are kind of hidden at the top in the blue, right? Like if you see right at the top peak where oh, they yeah, come, right here? their skulls. This line right here? Yep. Yeah, if you zoom in, looks like the skull and bones. Hmm. of the Skull and Bones Society, which actually got its roots in those years. Yeah, maybe he had become a mason by the end of his life. Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, I need to look up who that woman is. Okay, I can look. Actually, Skull and Bones was in 1832, but was brought from, because it was American, but was brought from the ideas of things that go pre that in England. Hmm. Yeah, I think it was, it was common on older graves to have skull and bones a lot. Well, it was um, weird. It wasn't really like bones. It was kind of like... Oh, it no. looked like rifles almost. Yeah, it's just a, it's a lot. Sorry, Brian. I I was looking for the um. What is it gonna? If someone's gonna talk about the figures, someone probably knows somewhere in the chat. Hmm. Oh, well, there's the 3D version of it. <laughs> or I have the um like Google Earth version. So we could actually see who's around this area. <clears throat> Hmm. So I was going to say, his studies of the Temple of Solomon, it's all, it's all, um, of course it was Rosicrucian, but then, you know, that becomes like kind of the central point of Freemasonry and then all of his studies. And then it's weird that, you know, in 2060, the year that he says it's all going to end, um, a large amount of media attention circulated around the globe regarding largely unknown and unpublished documents evidently written by Isaac Newton indicated that he believed the world would end no earlier than 2060. The story garnered vast amounts of public interest and found its way onto the front page of several widely distributed newspapers all over the world. 
Um, and the two documents detailing the prediction are currently housed within the Jewish National and University Library in Jerusalem. Both were believed to be written toward the end of Newton's life, around 1705, when he was knighted. Hmm. A time frame most notably established by the use of the full title of Sir Isaac Newton within portions of the documents. These documents do not appear to have been written with the intention of publication, and Newton expressed a strong personal dislike for individuals who provided specific dates for the apocalypse purely for sensational value. Furthermore, he had no time provides a specific date for the end of the world in either of these documents. To understand the reasoning behind this 2060 prediction and understanding of Newton's theological beliefs should be taken into account, particularly his apparent uh, beliefs and his Protestant views of the papacy. Both of these lay essential to his calculations, which ultimately would provide the 2060 time frame. Hmm. You know what's interesting? I wonder if... Um if there's a clue as to what you were looking for in the fact that the person who bought all of those documents, the, the secret documents of Isaac Newton, was John Maynard Keynes, who was a big ec um, ec economist from the uh, 1930s, 40s. Right. So I'm wondering if, um, if it's something to do with economics that he... that I, I've always wondered why did he purchase those documents? But I guess economy, the uh, studying economics would be something considered to be scientific too. So, you know, he would have obviously been interested in Isaac Newton. Yeah, they're saying in secret societies that he's often associated with them in the fraternal orders, but because the beginning of the Masons was right around the time he was born that it was so new that you would keep it secret, not even the membership. Mm. And that a lot of his associates that he hung around were all Masonic. And even considering there are supposedly a number of Masonic buildings that have been dedicated to his honor, that even there are Freemason lodges, like the University of, um, I, saw, I saw that just right here in this, uh, uh, the English physicist, the Isaac Newton University Lodge is a Mason Lodge. Um, really? Yep. <laughs> I just found something The Isaac here. Newton University Lodge is a Freemason's Lodge. Oh. And also, um, I, do I need to, like, I need to switch no, this No, no, thing? no, no, you're good. Um, I just found what those figures are on the grave. Mm -hmm. And look at this. Um, the painting on this, okay. Look, we could read all of this, but on top of the globe sits a figure of Urania, the muse of astronomy, leaning upon a book. Didn't you say he was, where's Uranus in his chart? In the uh, 15 degrees first of house, Scorpio, right? yeah. But they didn't know about Uranus at that time, right? No. So isn't it interesting that they put that figure, Urania, on his grave, the muse of astronomy. With the star <clears throat> above. Leaning on a book. Um, on either end of the base is his coat of arms, two shin bones in saltire within a decorative cartouche. And then also above the sarcophagus is the reclining figure of Newton in classical costume. Um, on his, his right elbow resting on several books representing his grace works, great, great works. Divinity, chronology, optics. The Principia and mathematics here. He points to a scroll with mathematical design shown on it, the converging series held by two standing winged boys. The painting on this scroll has been erased or cleaned off um, in the early 19th century and was repainted in 1977 from details in Newton's manuscripts. I wonder what was there that ended well, up Well, Ur Urania is the, in mythology the muse of astronomy mm -hmm. and in later times of Christian poetry. Hmm. His parents were Zeus and... Nem uh, Nemimacine, one of the many people that Zeus raped. Hmm. So, she's kind of really not connected with Uranus. Yeah, but it's just interesting that the name is similar. 
right? I mean, it sounds like like urine. <laughs> yeah. And it looks like a ball of urine. What, this? Yeah. Urania. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm going to be, I'm always honest. I, I've always been interested in him, but I've never had a, a, a very big, like, oh my gosh, he blows my mind. <laughs> I just think he's fascinating because of his, just the fact that a person like him could live at that time and, and focus on, okay, let's talk about him before he was discovered by all of these right. big wigs, right? That he could come from a farm background like he did, unless it was an all invented story, right? Um, but that he could come from that from background. From rags to riches, basically. And learn. And, and or rags to aristocrat, aristocrat to yeah. monarch loved knighthood. Right. And I just always have felt like for him to get knight, to be knighted, and to end up working for the Mint, like the ultimate establishment job, seems so opposite of his See, beginnings. It seems to like me. Elton John to me. Like <laughs> it you're does. Knighted, like, he like, lived like that Elton long John <laughs> couldn't even pick up a sword. The original <laughs> knighthood and the original knights and the Knights Templar, right. it's a disgrace to them <laughs> of fighting for and understanding the Temple of Solomon and all that stuff, right? Like, it, it like, yeah, it, 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 he's the beginning of let's start knighting people to knight them because we like what they do. Right, and to realize like, we can actually use this guy for something else and whether or not he was aware of it, he was, it, it, it does kind of remind me of the handlers of Kim Kardashian, <laughs> right? right. That, that, since that just came out, right? And I'm thinking exactly. of that story. I, uh, yeah. And he's too connected with Hitler's chart as far as. <laughs> well, when you saw that, I couldn't believe. I mean, I mean I it's exact in the exact time they lose their minds. And, you know, they have just like only so much you, as an historian. I'm sure you can only go off what's there. Right. Mm -hmm. So they have these letters of him saying to John Locke that, you know, he's not in a good space, but. What else was going on? Was he having a, a, a conscious, you know, basically I would say that he was a, having a conscious, like horrible moment of fear of being exposed for who he's connected with or how maybe something was trying to come in and he had to take the deal or he had to take the agreement and it was a spiritual consciousness. Oh, they, they, they like the Trinity, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, it's just, it's like the, when people have a break and they're never the same again, to me, is what I, what it, I just think of who, who is like, that. I mean, so many people become like that, like Elton John's a great example, although I don't know whether he's had any sort of a break. <laughs> or he's like a Joe Rogan, where it's like, okay, yeah, he says stuff and he, wow, he's, he's number one in media and he's different and you know, he'll, he'll say things that the media won't say, but then he'll retract and still bow the knee for are the money. Are you saying Joe Rogan and is like Isaac Newton or like... Yeah, yeah. Like he's like a, a Joe Rogan where, you know, like it's, it's got the optics of, especially since Isaac Newton loved optics, <laughs> right? it's got the optics of, oh, I, no, I'm, I'm bringing in all these systems and I'm for God too and alchemy and science and i'm bringing them all and joe rogan's mm -hmm. for freedom and he's he's for you know not being on the mainstream press right but he'll bend the knee well I th you know what i mean yeah. like he'll bend the knee and but, he won't go mm -hmm. all the way there right yeah whereas you have somebody like alex jones who's had on a show will go all the way there right and now is you know of course joe, joe rogan now is in court having to fight off a million things for mm -hmm. freedom of speech. Like if he wants to question an event that's happened in life that the media is telling him, I'm surprised mm -hmm. he hasn't used that as a defense. It's like, Hey, this is what you guys are saying. I'm allowed to question the media. The media is supposed to be questioned. The freedom of the press is not just to put out the press, but the freedom of the press is also to question the press. Mm -hmm. and that's all he's doing.
if you really think about it, the families are upset because it happened to them, but somebody is behind that to attack him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So Joe Rogan bends the knee to the Biden world and the Biden administration or anybody who is doing this weird media kind of like crazy, the Associated Press and how they have the optics on everybody. He, he, it makes people think, oh, he's on the team, but really he's not on the team when he won't go far enough or he won't like stand for that or he'll apologize so many times and that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he's not fully going there. Right. Just how Isaac Newton will hold in that he doesn't believe in the Trinity. Right. And he and will go to the church execute and execute counterfeiters, right? For, right. Right. And he's behind hunting them down at the end of his life and making sure that they do get that. Punishment. Right. It's like if Joe Rogan starts hunting down false news soon mm -hmm. and it would be independent media networks and, and YouTubers. Well, but we'll like imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine if that's what happens. Imagine if Joe Rogan is the guy who starts coming after, you know, independent podcasters. Right, because he knows the, the system. He knows how it works. Right. So, but we'd have to think about in 300 years, will Joe Rogan have done something that is still shaping the center of an academic field at that time? Yeah, he broke right. the record where he has more viewers than the mass media. Right. Right. But, he, but I mean, like... It, so, like, that's the first time that's ever happened where an independent mm -hmm. person that's not on in the mass media, it's not even an over-the-top... I guess you could call it an over-the-top OTT media, which is over-the-top, meaning that you don't need to go through the box, you don't need to go mm -hmm. through the typical routes that you could more people are going on a route that's not the main route mm -hmm. to get the information. So he broke that, right? Like, right. holy cow, right? Or he's doing, his 10 million on average or more on a show is more than pretty much the collected all of cable television at one moment. When Tucker Carlson's at like 2.8 live watches and then you go down the list, it's just news and then the main, you know, networks, and that's it. Like, there's nothing, you know. And so I guess that's, that's not really revolutionary maybe for us at the moment. At the mm -hmm. time, people were probably like, well, I we came up with this cool new thing called calculus. Well, that's cool. I don't know anything about it. But, <laughs> all right. <laughs> well. Which I never took just, calculus. I think, but it's funny that it's sort of like, I'm trying to think of someone like this. Like, Isaac Newton was like the genius of his era that did things this is what's interesting that he did things and figured out the math that all the elite people who were trying to do it couldn't figure well, out well then it would be elon musk on how nasa hires spacex right. to get them to space or the starlink system of satellites to except beam, for even right? elon musk comes from a richer family right doesn't he come from a wealthy he comes family? from south america south or africa south africa yeah and right. I don't know his exact money roots, but, yeah. you know. So, because it's kind of like, well, okay, let's take, let's take you. <laughs> You're a genius astrologer doing your thing. Yeah, but, I, but it's you not even through, relatable. But you came through and learned it in your way, right? And you've stayed true to your voice throughout your career. I think. Yeah, but that's not and, comparable to but Isaac Newton. No, but Newton. it's not. It's, well, because it he is. didn't hold his voice, right? <laughs> but or he, so he what didn't I'm hold the line. You created. A, you've done a lot of innovations. That one day we will also see that. Oh wow, look! That was like what David Palmer used to do. And I mean, I'm not just trying to be flattering you as I'm sitting here, but I'm I'm saying that you have been an innovator in astrology and in doing the media and all of that. So it would be like, okay, you are who you are, the Isaac Newton of astrology. <laughs> I'd um, like the, I'd say the, the John D, but. Okay, the John D of astrology. And then let's say Biden came in in 2020 and said, we really need you to come and take the shot. <laughs> and then you, let's say you did the Olivia Rodriguez. Right. 
and went which off. Which I did the opposite. Did so that's what ha- I think Newton had that break where he did the Olivia. He did the Olivia mm-hmm. and he did the Kardashian and he yeah. did the he did the he did the Jimmy Fallon. And we wouldn't know and there could have been a, a thousand other Isaac Newtons that we don't know about because they didn't do all that. Right? Right. And I would say that the person who is more relatable to him from rags to being known, but also he was more about prophecy, was, was Nostradamus. And, but he was exiled yeah, from the university where he, he was not. Mm-hmm. So yeah. actually, Nostradamus is the gangster. Well, we got to do a show on, on Nostradamus now. Yeah, we do. Especially since I'll be doing my new Hypergate 2.0 of prop, about oh, prophecy. That's right. And I'll be using, instead of John Dee's work, I'll be using Nostradamus' work and other prophets mm-hmm. and breaking it down. Because, you know, a lot of people have attempted to break down his quadrants and all of his stuff and all of his prophecies, but people tried that with John Dee's work and it was stated that it's never been cracked. I feel like I did crack it, so it's now time to go crack Nostradamus and teach people prophecy, which is what Isaac Newton didn't like either. <laughs> so really, he's... To me, I think a true, true, especially if you're going to use alchemy and God that's, and, and, and mix it with the science, would be, be prophetic. And he was against being prophetic, even though he secretly yeah, he just was prophetic. Calculated. So again, he's a, yeah. he's a not an honest guy. Yeah, he wasn't living up to the principles of alchemy, mm-hmm. right? And that's what you see in today. What I think the frustration is with people is the people who are living in their truth don't get the honors people mm-hmm. who do hide it and don't own it and will bite their tongue and not say anything and even be in a room with people who believe in the trinity when he's totally against it mm-hmm. get knighted and get a tomb with urania <laughs> i'm yes. not looking but, I, but you know what people who do the truth don't look for that people sell their soul to get those things yeah Yep. So maybe that's a deep, interesting lesson of, right? Like, if you don't sell your soul, you're not honored by a tomb. You're honored by the true energy of God and by what's helped others Mm -hmm. in life. Like, I don't know if Isaac Newton stuff has helped people. Nostradamus, at least, was trying to help people cure the Black Plague and made the rose pill and, mm-hmm. right, like was, yeah. was actually, and he survived the plague, not by sitting at home like his wife and kids who all died of it, but by being out traveling, trying to figure things out. Mm-hmm. And so I told people in 2020 was, don't sit at home. The people who sat at home died in all the plague history. So it's weird that when they tell people to shelter in place or whatever, or quarantine when you're not sick, that's, that's how you, you die more based off history. <laughs> and you have plague doctors coming in and bringing it. Right. So, wow, this was, in, this, you really enlightened me to a lot tonight. You I, enlightened me to a lot. That was, that was a whole new, <laughs> and I have a new way to teach about Isaac Newton. Yeah, especially that there was a lot of that stuff that came out, his secret writings, and, oh, I don't believe in prophecy, but 2060 is the end. <laughs> right? That's so true. And you know what? In Piper Gate right? 2.0, I'm going to throw in, because I found the documents that do have that, mm-hmm. and I'm going to crack where he's getting that. Of course, ironically enough, he's using... So he's not about the Trinity, but he's using things that come from the, the, the main, the, 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 the source of all this, which is the Catholic Church and, and, and understanding even the rebuilding of Jerusalem from the Jews and all these kind of mm-hmm. things. It's like he's going into things yeah. that hold so much of the stuff that he, I don't know, while being part of the Church of England, I'm like, that's just all confusing to me. That's just all like, what, are you a Jew or are you a this or are you a, the, what are yeah. you? Well, I think he would have thought he was purifying it. He was finding the real truth from what the Roman Catholic Church had said. I feel like if he was a Puritan, he would have gone into that, into that parliament and he would have told Queen Anne 
to shove it up her ass and to stop <laughs> sending people to, you know, go after Puritans in the new world or to not look at them the same way, even though that's what they ended up doing is colonizing those places. But, you know, to, right. to, to literally be like, let people be how they want to be. Yeah, and he wouldn't have been trying to establish the the Bank of England and right and propping up all of the economic orders of the of the fledgling British Empire. So, like he was helping to create the structure, the financial structure that would then finance that huge global empire. Yeah, because John D came up with those ideas, but then didn't actually put them into fruition, and actually was kind of pushed out of you know, Elizabeth the first, mm -hmm. you know, as her royal counselor and all that and an astrologer, because he was getting a little too magical. But right. And then that's why were... he that's why he was going to other, you know, places to try and like Maximus, right, Maximilian, to offer, like, look at this great work mm -hmm. to try and get out, to find somebody that at least would follow the true, the true divinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he was trying he stayed, to say that uh, empire would be good for right. what, like, bringing people together with. I, I mean, like, he had a noble idea, not, not the right. Just, and he didn't sacrifice that idea. Yeah, he stayed true to it, and then he created his own library, mm -hmm. and he taught people it. And he didn't. He never kneeled down to the churches or kneeled down. Uh, again, he didn't change his word. Or he didn't go against his work, or he didn't go mm -hmm. against his work. Yeah. I, I understand that maybe Isaac Newton had to cloak himself a little to stay alive, to get his work out. But at the end of the day, it, it seems that, I mean, he is a Capricorn, right? It's like, his, he's a Tiger Woods. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to win the Masters. Even if, even if I got to look like I got a wife and I'm doing the right thing, and then mm -hmm. really I'm banging other chicks and... You know, but is that what Isaac Newton was supposed to do with his North Node in Libra, or what should he have done? Do you think brought justice mm -hmm. to spirituality instead of like the the, the idea that it was in his twelfth house uh, brought justice to the spiritual world by like owning. If you don't believe in the Trinity, then you don't, and give the reasons why. Yeah, he should have. He should have published that. I bet you he would have made it if he would have been a spiritual scholar, way more of an impact on the world and people, and a, f a breath of fresh air for somebody saying what a lot of people that got on the Mayflower and other boats for the, the 20, 23 years before him and longer were all leaving and owning that, mm -hmm. calling himself a Puritan, not wearing the buckle in the New World is not a Puritan to me. Right, and I mean, not not coming out for your principles and not being afraid of what it, what's going to happen to you, right? Right, and then kneeling back to a, a monarch when you're born when one is being taken out, whereas a Puritan left the monarch and never kneeled again. Yep. At least never in front of one, because when they colonized it, it wasn't like they were kneeling to the monarch or they didn't have governor generals then. Mm -hmm. the same way they do now for Canada or Australia. Like, you know, they had people who represented the king, but not like kneel to this person and then wearing like a smaller crown or something or, you know, like. Mm. That's what I think gets me the most is his idea of being pure and puritism is not like, like, like. A real Puritan left in the middle of the crisis and didn't, if they didn't believe in the Trinity, they, they, they got on a boat and left and they went, okay, we're going, we're going to go where we can go instead of, oh, well, let me not say anything. Let me well, just, you know what I mean? Let me keep trying. Yeah. It's like James the second did. Yeah. Like he got out of there because he was not, he was going to be Roman Catholic. So he left and he let a lot, and William and Mary came over because he wasn't going to give up his religious principles. See, that's a true soul. Hmm. That's that's what. So so the idea that I'm coming to my. No, I don't know if it's a full conclusion, but 
if you're going to claim that you're using divinity to get to the science, is the science correct if you can't be pure in your own divinity yourself? That using John Dee's work, you have to be willing to be a spiritual tyrant, right? Instead of a tyrant to spirituality. Mm -hmm. That he ended up in the abyss and into the abyss of the material. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. he focused so much more on the material, too, of his work. But what's funny is that Isaac Newton would have thought, nobody will ever know my true beliefs, because he thought it was hidden away or... You know, people were taking care of it. No one talked about it in his biographies. So he never knew one day someone was going to buy all those documents and put them out in the world. So now we all know what he really believed. And we don't know all of it because he burned a bunch of them. Yeah, so who knows what else was there. And that's what I'm saying are those are the things that actually would... It's ironic on how he's, well, he's extremely well known for a position that was maybe not even... He had no control over, right? That others like the queen, Queen Anne and stuff, put him in the position to be that. And really though, that's the, the deepest frustration would be like, I want to be known for these other things, but he was honestly too afraid. And I thought he was actually more of like a, and I th that's the truth though. It's like, you look at Galileo, you look at all these people who had to really dodge the real hard stuff. He didn't really have to dodge that mm -mm. hard and enough to where he could say, oh, the Trinity. <laughs> when everybody probably knew, like, hey, this fool doesn't believe in the Trinity. Don't worry about it. It's just Isaac, it's just Isaac in the corner. He's just going to tell you to close the window. <laughs> like, that's not a rough shed. life. Like, you know what <laughs> I mean? He's in a shed with his little assistant, stayed with him for 20 and, years. And, and it goes back to his childhood or, or his early years. Two random people in his town just went and said, you're smart. We're going to fund you. Hmm. But that's in his chart, right? He was just going to be yeah. that type of... I mean, of yeah. Yeah, it's secret funding and, you know. So he couldn't help it that he was just going to be a, tool, a, what you, a puppet for people. <laughs> he was going to go out and do the work. They identified him. They scouted him out and saw, oh, this guy can do our work for us. And he won't even know. Pretty much. I mean, it could have been a couple, couple wigs, Tories. Yeah. Right? It wasn't like where, where he was born more north, you said, right? Mm -hmm. hmm. Lincoln, sure. Well, I guess maybe we'll start Unsolved Mysteries, <laughs> History in the Stars version yeah. one day. But at the end of the day, I mean, you know, there is a lot of validity, uh, validity to his work. So, But now you've got me questioning a lot of it what would have been different right and well, if we same goes for that, hitler right when you go into the questions of his work or sending yeah. everybody to the arctic and sending him down to antarctica and all that we're not allowed to know about and what the what the the captain of that ship saw hmm. and the ice walls and all these other worlds and all this stuff right like there's all this stuff right with anybody born of pluto and gemini in the eighth house whether it's Isaac Newton or whether it's Hitler, there's a lot of questions that it's a, it's a long, deep hole that you're like, hmm, hmm, what? <laughs> like, so the science, so you would think in a war, the scientists that were trying, they were using the V2, the end of the war, the V2 rockets were used and they killed more people than all of the fucking, all of the bombs and all of the Luftwaffe combined, right? That was what they did. That's mm -hmm. what Hitler did. Launched whatever V2s we have and they killed a bunch of people. They don't talk about that much. And then the, in, in most war, you would be like, okay, who's the guy Von Braun? You created those for putting you into prison. No, you're going to join our team. Right. That's where you start going, hmm, w what about the people around Newton? It was like, well, you're going to start a revolution where we just follow science. And one day we're going to get crazy technologies that we're going to put into people. And you're going to set the way. Well, I mean. So he probably died going, oh, no. Well, by now, maybe he came, maybe he's back. I don't know, is don't Anthony know. Fauci's chart similar? He's another Capricorn. He is another Capricorn, but no, that, I don't know, that, that's where it all gets interesting, but we'll see one day. Yes, we will. I mean, if the UFO stuff comes out and, and defies gravity, 
right? Then, mm -hmm. then, then Isaac Newton is... Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who've already displaced right. him, right? Right. And, but I do think pre-1693 Isaac would have expected to be displaced, right? That you, if you truly cared about the science and the divinity and all of that, you're always questioning, you always want to know what, how is this world really working? And for us to think we're ever going to figure it out and know for a fact this is how it works, to me is just, why do we want, why? Why do we need to know that? Why are we so certain we know the answer? Well, as Chiron and Gemini within one degree of his, mine seven degrees, this is eight, I feel sad for him that he mm -hmm. was afraid to put out what he really thought. Mm -hmm. That's the Chiron Gemini journey is you can't let your fear and your wounds of not being heard or whatever, you just still put it out. You don't freak out and write letters to your private friends only and hey, this is me. Right. You put it out there. And in the eighth house, he definitely licked his chops that way instead of healing his wounds by putting it out there. Hmm. Probably because he was too afraid to make a mark on the work that he had done that would make him famous or something, you know? So that's sad, right? Because it doesn't matter if it shouldn't taint the work, his. Right. If, right? That that's, that's, that's where he's. Is it really credible if you're putting out work? It'd be like somebody putting out a peer reviewed paper, but it's not really peer reviewed. It's just like, this is my scientific theory. And. I have a lot of contradicting beliefs to the, the God portion of it that's proving it to be published and not saying it publicly. That might be similar to some folks today with their papers. Like when I, well, when I got published, everything was good, but when things weren't going right, right, I told them no and that we'll battle the contract out, but I'm not doing this two year contract. Mm -hmm. And then they, at least at the same time, just went, okay, we'll just get out of the contract. Because I was like, you guys aren't doing what we agreed with. Yeah. Right? But it's like, he's just like, ah, they'll stay in it. <laughs> so. But he didn't know about Chiron, so maybe no. he did. No. And I don't know if he really followed enough astrology either, like for maybe the understanding spiritually of it for himself or following astrology in the sense of like timing and his own drawing up of his own horoscope for himself. Hmm. Yeah, he understood the math and he was obsessed about the math, right? But maybe not the meanings behind it. Correct, yeah. Well, that was a good one. That was a good and I one. look every two weeks we'll be doing this. Um, so every so the two weeks from now on Fridays, History in the Stars. Make sure that you follow Dr. Ann Wolke. She's at Ann. I have another one that's the that's oh historical. yeah that's right. Um, Which one is it? It's his, at, it's historical, but I'll have to I don't know I'll have to put it under the video. We'll or put something. it under the video, mm -hmm. um, so you can follow all of her work. And we love doing this show, and we love to always hear your opinions and. Also, of course, if you have people that we might want to go into or mm -hmm. other parts of history that you love, we appreciate you all so much. I appreciate you, Anne, so much. And I appreciate you, too. And make sure that you join us on High Vibe by just going to the website or to our apps and becoming a member. Truly appreciate it. We'll see you on the next History in the Stars. Bye. <laughs>